town plan and zoning commission meeting, special meeting agenda, special meeting for November 15th, 2022. Um, before we get to the minutes, I wanted to uh, recognize a, a former member. We received a letter of resignation from Freda Gordon, uh, who served on the uh, commission for the last five years as an alternate as she's moving out of town. Um, but I wanted to take this time to thank Freda, who is, I know, not here. Um, we'll have to express, but to nonetheless express at least my gratitude, certainly the commissions as well, uh, but to recognize her for her service over the last five years. Um, so for the record, uh, reflect that she was a great uh, commissioner. I enjoyed ha serving with her. Um, Fairfield did well having her on this commission, and we're sorry to see her go, but we hope the best for her. Uh, anybody else? Mr. Chair, well, thank you. Well said. Uh, I enjoyed very much serving with Freda. She served with distinction, and she will be missed. Very dependable, responsible, always attentive. Thank you. So, having said that, we'll move on. Uh, meeting minutes uh, from our October 11th, 2022 meeting. Uh, may I have a motion? Move to approve. Move to approve from Commissioner Francis. Second, Commissioner Ford. Seems so long ago, but any issues? <laughs> no. Commissioner Ford? Uh, nothing. Nope. Nothing I saw either. Any other member of the commission? Or can we put this to a vote? We have two, four. We have all seven regular members with, with Kathy. With uh, Kathy, okay. I will abstain from the vote on the minutes because I didn't have the chance to review the entire video. Okay. Commissioner uh, Braun, anything to add? I think you're voting ahead of me. Okay. All those in favor, <laughs> please say aye or raise your hand. All right. I see six hands, one abstention. Uh, so the minutes pass 601. My apologies. No worries, Commissioner. Uh, moving on, 376 Quincy Street, referral for recommendation regarding town acquisition. Mr. Wendt. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, this, this I will introduce Mr. Barnhart, who is going to present this matter to you, but just as a matter of procedure, this, this, um, this is a referral to the Board of Selectmen and to the RTM. It doesn't require an approval or, 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 um, or denial of this commission. It's in order for the RTM to vote to accept uh, the town property, a positive referral would be a simple majority. If, if you were to offer a negative referral, it would require a two-thirds majority of the RTM. But with that, I will introduce uh, Mr. Barnhart uh, with respect to this proposal. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, for the record, Mark Barnhart, Director of Community Economic Development. Um, I think, um, as Mr. Wendt indicated, the town's uh, considering the purchase acquisition of 376 Quincy Street, which is within the Parkview Commons or Navy housing development. Um, this has been uh, reviewed uh, and approved by the Affordable Housing Committee, uh, which uh, not only recommended the purchase, but also authorized the use of housing trust fund monies for that, uh, for the acquisition, as well as the Board of Selectmen. Uh, it is before you tonight, as Mr. Wen indicated, as part of an 824 referral. And um, from, from here, it'll need to go before the representative town meeting. I think you're all familiar with the Navy Housing uh, Development Parkview Commons. The town uh, first uh, purchased that property from the United States government back in uh, 2004, uh, subsequently uh, made available uh, 22 of the existing units as uh, affordable home ownership units, uh, subdivided the property and deed restricted those for, for sale. Um, we, things were going okay through uh, uh, Superstorm Sandy However, um, you know, it's an area that is within the flood zone. Uh, the properties are below the uh, flood elevation that's required for that area. And so we've been working uh, to uh, put together a redevelopment plan for the site. Uh, we have uh, to date acquired with uh, this commission support, uh, 350, 362, 378, I mean 385 and 409 Quincy. So we have four properties to date, two of which have uh, holdover tenants in them. All were, were done with uh, cons consensual, in the, in the sense they were made available for, for repurchase, and we work with the homeowners there to do so. 
Uh, this property is a little different because it's in foreclosure. And um, it has been in foreclosure for some time. The action was stayed uh, because of a bankruptcy proceeding. Uh, that has now been uh, been lifted. Uh, the court ordered uh, foreclosure by sale. Uh, the town is one of many creditors. Uh, we actually are owed money uh, based on down payment assistance we provided to the to the existing homeowner, and we're interested in acquiring the property when it is made available uh, at auction. Uh, our attempt is to work with the other creditors to to uh, ensure that we can acquire the, reacquire the property at the lowest. Uh, most cost, but obviously the mortgage lender is, is the one that uh, is, is most uh, most uh, top of mind. So um, we did get the uh, the court to um, uh, basically uh, postpone the, the sale date until January uh, of uh, 2023, so that we'd have time to secure the necessary approvals, including a referral to this board. So I'm happy to answer any questions that the uh, commission may have at this time. Any questions? Commissioner Braun? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? So, yeah. uh, can you explain a little bit about what the plan is for this parcel if we are successful at the uh, foreclosure auction? Sure. Uh, so this, this property is actually adjacent to two other properties that the town currently owns. So our original plan was to assemble um, approximately four to five lots that would comprise roughly an acre. And then we would do partner with a nonprofit or for profit development partner uh, to redevelop the site uh, for a new, new uh, either duplex, triplex or something appropriate that would be construct new construction at the appropriate foot elevation. So that is, that is our current plan to assemble this as, as part of uh, the two other contiguous lots that we currently own, all of which are conforming uh, in a resident B zone. They are at least 9,000 square feet. They're conforming from a lot size requirement uh, for a duplex. And um, a triplex or a duplex is, um, this is for Jim, I guess, um, that's a, accommodated in that, um, in that zone, and also, what are the two other adjacent lots? Is it 362 and 350? 352, 350 and 362, correct. So, what's there now? Other single-family homes? So, this would be one. They're all they're all single-family, three-bedroom, one-bath, uh, single-story ranch houses. Uh, they just happen to be built uh, too low, slab on grade. So, all three houses be demolished and one triplex would be built is that the plan no we would we would build uh, new new on each lot we would, so uh, potentially as many as uh, with three lots as many as nine units so three three triplexes so you'd ex be expanding our affordable housing then correct oh, from what it is now because it's all affordable now right yes it and is even the one that so we would not only like preserve the existing but we would hope to expand the number of units there. Are all the units in this whole area all considered affordable now, just not town owned? Uh, there are 22 affordable home ownership units within the development. There are also four duplexes uh, that are rental uh, that provide permanent supportive housing and they're owned by Operation Hope. Okay, so this would be continued. Would, would the size and scale of what you're building be sort of fit in with the neighborhood? That is our intent, yes. Although it would be raised for FEMA purposes, so it would be probably higher than the others, I guess. But I guess if you're redeveloping any of them, um, it would... Well, it'll, cer it'll certainly be higher than what's there currently, but I think it'll be consistent with what you, what you find elsewhere in the neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Harrison. Yeah, thank you. Now, I'm not sure if you know this, um, but was there any attempt to help the current homeowner that's in foreclosure? He bought that property from the town, right? He bought it from the town. Uh, it was fine for a while, and then recently uh, fell into arrears. Uh, we did Buy talk to him about or? repurchasing the property, and we didn't uh, come to some agreement. So, what was he? What was he fined for? What was that? What was the fine for? Was it blight or? No, no, no. It wasn't fine. We we weren't able to uh, come to an agreement in terms of reacquisition or purchase price. So. 
at this point he's ready to sell, but uh, there's the bank. Thank you. Commissioner Ford. Uh, just piggybacking on that, so <clears throat> that it couldn't be a short sale situation. Or We're yeah. certainly working with the town attorney to see if we can explore any option other than uh, foreclosure, you know, by uh, sale. Because you might get an outside investor come in. And well, we could, it. but there are uh, restrictive covenants that basically restrict the resale value, so it's really of limited value to anyone outside of the town. Uh, good point. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Levy. Just, uh, with, I know there are resale restrictions in terms of the percentage. Would the uh, maximum sale price exceed the outstanding mortgage, if you know? Um, I think what's owed on the... The sale price, it's appraised for higher than what the what's owed to the bank. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I, I don't think it would exceed what the maximum resale value of the property under the formula, if mm -hmm. that's what you're asking. Right. Yeah. It would not. Commissioner um, Ford, then Francis. Is there an IRS lien? Uh, not that I'm aware of. There's a uh, lien to the uh, Norwalk Hospital a lien to another housing provider, um, apparently got a second or third mortgage from, and then us, in addition to the bank. Just that uh, it could be risky. Could, so if you had a straight, strict foreclosure, you could just redeem on your law day, but it put the town in a better spot. Um, so the, then the, there's probably some equity there. There is definitely equity there, yes. Commissioner Francis. Um, how many houses are in this original Navy complex that eventually... Originally, when the town acquired, there were 28. Uh, the town tore down, we demoed two that were added to Veterans Park. Uh, four were subsequently demolished, and th those were the, you know, the lots were sold to Operation Hope, and they built four duplexes. And then the 22 remaining are deed-restricted affordable home ownership. Okay. Well, I was going to say, any other questions, or can we move to a vote? Do we need to take a vote now, all right? Vote isn't it today? Would be yeah. and just, I just want to confirm, this would go through to our 10% target, right? This definitely would, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it doesn't currently now. Sorry. Probably should have taken right. a vote. We probably should have gotten a motion on the table yeah. earlier. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's been a while. It's been a month. I yeah. <laughs> Can I have a motion? Yeah. I move to recommend yeah. uh, that the town uh, seek uh, acquisition of 376 uh, Quincy Street. I'll second. Second. Okay. So, Commissioner Braun. I was going to move and second, but they already they beat me to it. So. Uh, they beat. Yeah. <laughs> I guess pressing in for in person. Sorry. <laughs> Um, any other questions? No. Seems. Okay. All those in favor of the motion to recommend the acquisition, please say aye or raise your hand. <clears throat> Seven hands, so it passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Stick around. Yes, <laughs> please do. Lucky uh, you. Next item is cannabis prohibition, discussion of potential extension of prohibition. Mr. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, as you will recall Public Act 21-1, which was an act concerning responsible and equitable regulation of adult use cannabis, required municipalities to make an affirmative decision regarding cannabis uses as to uh, otherwise, uh, unless otherwise uh, defined in the zoning regulations, cannabis uses would be presumed to be uh, permitted. So in response to that, uh, uh, last year, uh, the commission voted to uh, prohibit all cannabis uses for a period of time, uh, which currently uh, extend, um, expires on February 28th of 2023. So we would need to go back to public hearing uh, to choose the next option for this commission, and those would include extending uh, the prohibition for another period of time uh, eliminating the terminal date of that prohibition or considering uh, adopting regulations to permit uh, cannabis sales and other uses. Um, you may recall this was tabled at the time. The state is still rolling out their process for assigning licenses. There are no, they, there are tentative licensees, but no uh, retail sales establishment has yet to uh, open. So we're still kind of waiting to see how this evolves. 
So we're just trying to get some guidance on how you might want to proceed uh, because we need to schedule something uh, to do one of those two things, uh, either extend the moratorium or the prohibition for another period of time um, so we can get that set up for a, a hearing going forward. So that's really the reason why it's on the agenda so you can think about that. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll leave that there and let you. Uh, so we've got the three options, which we're not there to to, uh, to really make a decision on, but it's either to extend the moratorium, yep. approve cannabis use in some way, prohibit it, I guess in total. But we, for any of those three, we need to have a hearing, public Correct. hearing. If, if we, right, do it, if, without further action, that current prohibition would expire at the end of February. But what we need to do is a motion to go to public hearing in some respect is going to be made. The question is whether it's a motion for a public hearing to extend the moratorium, mm -hmm. to yeah. accept a cannabis use in some way, or I guess prohibit it, to essentially advise what this public hearing is going to be. Correct, correct. Okay. Right, right now, the regulations say all after. cannabis uses are prohibited, but that prohibition expires yeah. at a date certain. So uh, you don't have to formally vote tonight. We just need guidance on how you want us to set up the future hearing okay. so we have something ready to go to hearing before the expiration date. And now, obviously, if we had, if we made a uh, motion for a public hearing to prohibit and we have the hearing on it, we are not limited to prohibiting it. We can right. kind of do what we want at a public hearing. Yep. But we need to at least give some guidance as to what the public hearing is probably going to look like. Um, yeah, I we think just, that's what we just want to start about. the conversation as to what you might be inclined how to proceed. So should I ask for a motion for public hearing for a certain category is what? Yeah, that's, probably, that's sure. Okay, that's so that's what I would request. And we can discuss that once we put a motion on the table. Question. In terms of it being a public hearing, could it simply be a public hearing to explore all three options and then uh, at the time of the public hearing, uh, kick it around and decide which way we want to go? Is that a possibility or or do we have to pick one of the three as the focus? We we could, but if, if you are looking to include the use option in adopting that and defining, we would need then to be ready to say where retail sales would be permitted, for example, and define that, and which of the menu of cannabis yeah. uses you want to consider permitting. Uh, right now, the regs just so we've defined, we list the definitions and say they're all prohibited uh, until uh, February 28th of 2023, unless further extended by the commission. We had, tab we had I'm not tab tabled or moved the moratorium because we were looking for more information really from the state that has not really been put out there yet. So. I mean, in that respect, we're kind of in the same position we were way back when. Um, and Mr. Wentz, right? I mean, it, I guess it'd be easy to do moratorium or prohibition. It's if we really are going to move forward with adopting regulations. What are those regulations? So, you know, staff would have to help. We would have to get maybe even, you know, involved with planning or such. So, um, it'd probably be wise at least set the stage a little bit. Yeah. Commissioner, uh, let's. Harrison. Harrison, yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> It's been a while. Um, yeah, I just I also mentioned I think it was February of last year or this year that we had that meeting. I also would like to hear from the public. I know Fairfield Cares came that night and talked to against it, and I, I think it's really important to get information from different stakeholders, not just the state, um, because this will really impact our town. Um, so I, I just want to. No, that's fine. Let's put a motion on at least, and then we can discuss it a little bit more. Commissioner Levy, I saw you. Yeah, I'd like to. Uh, Move that we schedule this for a public hearing to consider an additional one-year moratorium beyond the uh, February date. Commissioner Raymond. Second. Okay. So, um, I'm sorry I interrupted you, Commissioner Harrison. Anything else? No, I would just, you know, hope, you know, staff, you know, the media, I just hope we can, you know, get word up. I would love to hear from the public on this topic. You know, I know last year we kind of vowed to do some homework, to do some research. I don't think that's happened. It's been a busy year, so I'd, I'd like to see that happen by this commission. Yeah. Well, I mean, a lot of it was somewhat dependent on how things would roll out from the state. That didn't really happen either. So it's a little bit of both. Um, but we should be inviting stakeholders. Thank you. I mean, that's the whole point of public notice as well, too. And I think the idea of at least outlining what we're inclined to be discussing first and foremost. But any other members of the commission have comments? Commissioner Braun. Yeah, I, I – support putting this for a public hearing to hear the pros and cons. I don't think I ever got anything about the pros, 
We heard a lot about the cons. So I, I, I would recommend a public hearing. And just a point of order for tonight, I have to take a 20 minute break right now to help a family member. So um, I'll let you know when I can come back. Thanks. Okay, please tell me, uh, okay. Commissioner Kelly. I'll, I'll be here. Be back. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're considering we're in the same spot of moratorium makes sense, but at least framing it as such, and then we can have the public hearing, which is. Yeah, I mean that's required. helpful. I mean, again, we'll we'll have to schedule this for for uh, time to have that hearing, and then for your deliberation before the expiration date at the end of February. But that gives us guidance on how we'll at least publish, and then we can. Um, have the further detailed discussion from there. Yeah, and I mean, to the extent that the public is listening and stakeholders are listening, please, you know, when we have this public hearing come and we can discuss not just the moratorium, but the topic itself, pros, cons for um, allowing in, allowing it, allowing it in some places, allowing it in, in some ways, or prohibiting it. We should be ready for that conversation then, and, you know, hopefully we'll get some more information then, and if at that time, you know, maybe a moratorium to allow us more planning and such, but um, we should be taking this as an opportunity to gather information. Commissioner uh, Harrison, then Bra yeah, Braman. Yeah, just a question, and um, for Mr. Wendt, I, I don't think you can answer this tonight, but maybe is it possible to find out how many towns I guess currently have a moratorium? We could try. At last I looked, the state had not updated their website since December of last year in terms of they had that initial listing right. of what towns were doing, um, but they have that's not been up to date. There's been some turnover in the OPM office that is managing that. So we will try to get a snapshot view, but last time it was the vast majority of towns were either prohibiting or moratorium. There were a, a number of towns, a, a minority number of towns uh, that were allowing them and have since crafted regulations to permit such uses, but none of those uses have yet come to pass through the, the this arduous licensing process that the right. state is rolling out. There's been a, a litany of things going on yeah, in terms of lawsuits and this, that, and the other thing that, that have slowed the anticipated rollout of this program, so. Thank you. Commissioner Brightman. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to note that obviously some towns have approved of the use of cannabis, uh, you know, for retail purposes, uh, and so, some cities and others have pro prohibited it outright. And our town uh, took the middle ground, as many uh, town other towns did, um, to see uh, what uh, would happen with the retail cannabis at the state level in terms of the licensing procedure and the rollout. Um, and because we're, as you said, Mr. Chair, we're still in the same position we were in when we made that decision. I do think it makes sense to at least frame the question as a moratorium. Any other members of the commission? Or can we put this to a vote? The motion on the table is to move to a public hearing to discuss extending the moratorium. But again, obviously, we'll be discussing it in total, but at least framing the hearing in that respect. All those in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. See seven hands, passes unanimously. Okay. Moving on, new applications for recommendation to public hearing, 345 Reef Road Special Permit and Coastal Site Plan application of Phoenix at 345 Reef Road Corp pertaining to three multifamily residential dwellings containing a total of nine dwelling units in the neighborhood design district. Mr. Wen. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, this as the address, um, a similar project was approved by this commission, the adjacent piece, and is under construction at the former medical office building at 321-325 Reef Road. This is the adjoining vacant parcel that used to be the site of Hampton's uh, nursery or flower shop. Um, so it's a similar proposal uh, of nine units broken down into three individual buildings rather than one existing building. Um, but it is a special permit uh, that does require a public hearing. May I have a motion? Commissioner Levy. Move to public hearing. Commissioner Harrison. Second. Commissioner Levy. Requires a hearing. <laughs> Commissioner Harrison. Requires a hearing. We may put this to a vote. Any other comments? All those in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. See seven hands, passes unanimously. The zoning regulation amendments 
uh, I'll call both B and C together. Zoning regulation amendment application on spot on Fairfield LLC to amend section 12.4.12 .12 regarding veterinary hospitals to include boarding and dog daycare and 2269 post road special permit application of spot on Fairfield LLC to establish a veterinary hospital with boarding and dog daycare in existing building in the design commercial district. Mr. Wise. Okay, Mr. Chairman, these two items, 2269 Post Road is currently is the site of the former Hyundai uh, auto dealership. Uh, there is a veterinary use that was looking to establish a veterinary hospital, but as a, a large part of that proposal, um, seeking to include dog daycare and overnight boarding, which is currently prohibited um, in parcels that adjoin residential property. So it is a regulation amendment uh, to permit a portion of the use that they're proposing and then a special permit to establish that use, both of which require public hearing. May I have a motion for these two items? Commissioner Levy. Move to public hearing. Thank you. Commissioner Brayman. Second. Any comments? None. <laughs> Commissioner Brayman. O only that a public hearing is required. Yeah. Um, Mr. Wendt, the veterinary hospital is a permitted use in this area? That Correct. But it itself requires a uh, special permit anyways? Well, the way they're, they're phrasing it, frame, because it's in conjunction with a uh, boarding and dog daycare, what, they're tra what the amendment is seeking to do is establish the overnight boarding and daycare in conjunction with that veterinary use, so making it a special permit use. Okay. I mean, if we put that aside, would a veterinary hospital just in general is if, if the boarding or daycare were not part of this proposal and they were just occupying the site as a veterinary hospital, it would be a zoning compliance Okay. That's Unless right. there was new concern. No, that's fine. I just want to make sure I wrap my head around yep. it. Any other comments? There's, there's oh. one right there already, near there. Okay. Veterinary office right on the I just didn't know if the special permit needed for a veterinary to begin with. Just curious on that. Can we put this to a vote? All those in favor for these two items of moving to a public hearing, please say aye or raise your hands. See seven hands, so it passes unanimously. Moving on to old business, 917 Mill Hill Terrace, request of Maplewood Senior Living for a 100% release of a 1,900, excuse me, $191,285 bond pertaining to special exception improvements. Mr. Wendt. Okay, Mr. Chairman, you may recall this, uh, it's been a month, but uh, this bond release was tabled at the last meeting. We did get uh, an email late, uh, either, I don't recall whether it was the day before or the day of the meeting from a neighbor expressing concern about the condition of the adjacent meadow. Uh, and we were asked to provide additional information regarding that, which we subsequently did. Uh, which essentially boiled down to the, uh, the conservation stewardship easement that was part of the inland wetlands permit. And there's a long-term management plan as part of that wetlands permit that is monitored and bonded through the conservation department. Um, we had also provided the itemized uh, punch list of items that were included in the TPZ bond um, and the, the uh, the result of that, or, or, or it is, it's our opinion that all of the TPZ bonded improvements have been completed um, to our satisfaction and that of the town engineer in the issue with respect to whatever issue there may be uh, with respect to the meadow uh, is part of that conservation stewardship easement and long-term management plan that's bonded through the conservation department. So it is our um, staff position that all the TPZ bonded improvements have been satisfied. Thank you. May I have a motion on the item? Commissioner Levy? Uh, move to release the uh, TPC bond in full. Commissioner Ford? I'll second. Commissioner Levy? Uh, based on the report of staff, uh, it appears that all improvements have been fully completed and the bond should be released. Commissioner Ford? I agree. No further, just based on Mr. Wendt's comments, <clears throat> I don't think there's any reason to withhold it. Question. Commissioner Harrison. The neighbor who reached out to us, has she been contacted or has there been correspondence to satisfy the, the issues that she brought up? I have spoken to, not recently, okay. but it's been over the years. This is, I think, year four of the management plan. We have had prior correspondence to that, and uh, she has also had correspondence with the Conservation Commission, so I've not had any directly as a result of this latest 
round. Um, but in, in I understand her position on the matter, but again, the condition in, in the upkeep of that meadow is not, in my opinion, not in our jurisdiction. All right. Okay. Thanks. Commissioner Francis. And the walking trail that is now properly named, is that um, going to be town owned or owned no. by Maplewood? No, it's owned by Maplewood. So they're going to be responsible if anyone falls on it. It's very rough. The man took me walking there last month. Yeah, I'm. Very. I, I am not going to claim to be a liability expert, but it will be. It's, it's, it's privately owned. owned. It's not owned by the town of Fairfield. Because I, I asked him if he was considering a, a very primitive wooden type railing, and he said, "Oh, maybe I'll walk it and call you back." And he never has. So <laughs> that's my total knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. There is a a gentler entrance to that trail on the parking lot side of the property that has a similar public access trail sign um, at the top end of that parking lot. Um, um, yeah, so it just walks from Mill Hill Terrace. Yeah, and that was something that the commission wanted to have because of that breadth of that new sidewalk that's out there that, yeah. that, that there could be some, some access from, yeah. from there. I just, you know, I'm just going back to the emails from the, from, I think it's Sue Prescott, and she just said that the Maplewood were so-called shirking their responsibilities to enhance that area. So I just really want to be sure that they have met their, you know, their commitment because, you know, once this is released, we don't really have any. Yeah, again, my position is regardless of where you fall on, on her position, that's covered by a, a, Condition of approval and, and bond that the Conservation Commission and Department is holding. It's not. It wasn't a bonded item under our Understood. Okay. approval. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying. Any other members of the commission? Or can we proceed to a vote? <clears throat> All those in favor to release the bond, please say aye or raise your hand. C7 still passes unanimously. Free application review, 81 Black Rock Turnpike. The commission will conduct a non-binding free application review discussion for a potential development proposal. Uh, this is not a public hearing. This is a new, well, fairly new, I think, statutory, you know, remedy is not the right word, but statutory um, process for applicants to come, get a give a quick presentation about what potential this development proposal would be right. without going through all the ma major time and expense of what a re real application or a regular application looks like. It's not subject to public comments, but we should be, we should be, what's the word, forthcoming with our opinions and questions to give direction as best we can to the applicant. Um, so um, try and, I think the idea is that it to be a limited application um, in, as far as time-wise goes, but we should be, as I said, engaged in giving uh, feedback as best we can because um, I think that's the spirit of this statutory process. So, Attorney Russo. Chairman, members of the commission, Chris Russo uh, with Russo and Rizzi LLC, offices at 10 South Hill Road in Fairfield. Um, happy to be before you on this pre-application. Uh, on behalf of Post Road Residential uh, for the property located at 81 Black Rock Turnpike. Um, with me are Andy Montelli uh, from Post Road Residential uh, and Celan Pather from uh, Beinfeld uh, Architecture. Uh, this is uh, one of the more satisfying things for, for, for a land use attorney is to, is to come before you with a, an application where we're taking a property that is uh, an eyesore um, it, it really pro provides no economic value to the town right now, but it's in an area that is a very critical area of town and be able to come before you uh, with a proposed development uh, that will completely turn that around uh, and also uh, have it be designed in a way uh, for this particular case that's designed uh, in accordance with your T uh, 2019 TOD study. Um, so the site which I'm sure you've all driven by uh, multiple times. Uh, is okay, great. Uh, is 81 Black Rock Turnpike? 
Uh, it is in the designed industrial district uh, within the Commerce Drive um, area design district. It's, it's a 4.9-acre uh, site that currently sits vacant. Uh, there's, a, there's a concrete slab there. Um, but if you see it right here to uh, the east is where uh, Planet Fitness is, uh, across Black Rock Turnpike, that's where BJ's is. The train station is here uh, to its north, uh, and the train station parking lot is to its west, and uh, directly uh, to the south is, is Ash Creek. Uh, itself, it is located um, on Ash Creek Boulevard and does not have frontage. One of the unique things, and, and Andy's going to get into this when he talks about uh, the site, and, and I'll stop talking soon to let them, because they're really the ones who have, um, you know, come up with this development. Um, but one of the unique things about this particular site, it's a large site at 4.9 acres, but unlike some of the other larger sites that are in this design district, it does not have the frontage on some of the major corridors in this area. So Black Rock Turnpike, uh, Commerce Drive, Kings Highway East, or Kings Highway Cutoff. It's a bit of a unique feature to it, and Andy's going to talk about how that played in um, with the development. Um, and we're excited, we're very excited for this development for this property, uh, and particularly to be walk, working with Andy and Seelan, uh, who were involved uh, with the uh, Anchorage project over on Uncle Road, um, which was a very successful project, uh, not just because of the building and how that came out, um, but also how Andy uh, and his team approached that project, which was working with the neighbors, working with the town. I know some of you were on the commission at that time, and you may recall when we came in for that application, we actually had the support of our abutting neighbors. And Andy and his team are taking the same approach uh, now, uh, already working with the neighbors, uh, but also coming here before you uh, to try to get your feedback tonight. Uh, to help uh, make this uh, the best project it can be. So with that, I will turn over to Andy, uh, who can who can uh, get into the development. Um, thanks, Chris. And, and some of what Chris uh, yeah. suggested that I might talk about, um, I'm going to leave to Seelan. But let me tell you who we are. Uh, my Grand company Walter. is Post Road Residential. Mr. Montas, can you just slide over? Oh, oh you want? Oh, yeah, because I might be Thank so, you. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Interrupt. Yeah. Do you want to just announce yourself again so the, the mic picks it up? Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, my name is Andy Montelli, and uh, our company is Post Road Residential. Uh, let me first tell you a smidge about ourselves. Um, uh, I've been a multifamily developer since 1987. It's really the only job I've had after graduate school. And the only thing we develop is multifamily housing, luxury multifamily housing. Uh, for 26 years, my office has been above the community theater downtown. And in fact, uh, I'm a partner in that building with the Klebans. Um, and uh, in, in fact, uh, I'm here tonight with John McFadden, one of my partners, but um, McFadden, myself, uh, my son Thomas, who works with us, we all live in Fairfield. We're Fairfield guys. Um, I live right across the street, we, and we all live in, in the beach area specifically. Um, we, uh, although although we're based office-wise in Connecticut, uh, in Fairfield, and we live here, most of our work is in Metro Boston. Um, and uh, we have four large projects, over a thousand units now under construction up there. So we, um, we are considered a, um, a very blue chip company. Um, people like the Carlisle Group, very large public uh, investment fund, partner with us. They've, we've gone through their due diligence process, uh, and we've done a lot of business with those guys. But I think, as Chris was alluding to, um, for a developer who comes before you, there's nothing like a completed project to prove their bona fides. And, um, you know, over the years I've learned that a lot of commissions believe that maybe half of what they hear from developers. And if you apply that factor, um, the best way to see 
who we are and what we do is to go visit the Anchorage. And I'd be happy to show any of you that project. Um, as Chris said, I developed that project. Um, uh, my partners in that are uh, Bob Russo and Ray Rizzio, and it's been very successful. It's been extremely well received by our neighbors. And if you know that site, it's, it's smack in between uh, two large condominium projects, lots of owners nearby, and um, we to this day have a very, very strong relationship with those people because we delivered more than what we promised, and that's our MO. Um, this site uh, has been kicking around, and I've known about it for a good 10 years, and frankly, for nine of those years, I never really liked it that much. But um, this end of town is really starting to develop with more residential housing. And, and as important, maybe more important to us than the residential housing is the retail and the entertainment that's starting to come in. Um, can, I, can I mention the point that makes me just, you know, getting ballistic? Do we need yeah. Kind of yeah. So one of the things that's, you know, really exciting to us, and it kind of follows a pattern where we've developed in places um, near really great sort of amenities to attract our customers is that um, Planet Fitness has now moved out of that building and um, a really great concept of a, a brewery, a distillery, and a really big restaurant is moving in called Illicit Brewery. And um, so it's, I, think, I think, and that's our neighbor, that's our immediate neighbor. Um, that provides for our customers you know, a place where on a Tuesday night you can go get a, a beer and a burger. And that's about as good an amenity as um, that and being next to a train station, I should say, are about as good an amenity as we can offer um, customers. So we're, um, we're really thrilled with the site now. Um, we've come around to really believe in it in a big way. And, um, you know, we kind of like the fact that it's, it's on the uh, – it is an industrial site. It's got a lot of cleanup millions of dollars of cleanup, um, but um, we like the fact that we really don't have, um, you know, neighbors around us who, we, who, who might be concerned about the project. I mean, the project has very little impact, I believe, to the community. So one side of us, we've got the train uh, parking lot, the, the parking lot for the train station to the north of us is the train tracks. Uh, you know, we've got Black Rock Turnpike on one side and Ash Creek, the entrance to the, uh, uh, to the parking lot uh, on, on our fourth side. So it's a very kind of insulated project. Um, that location is re we've given a great deal of thought along with Seelan and his company to what the building ought to be. And um, Seelan and Post Road have done, I don't know, 10 projects together, something, nine, 10, including um, the Anchorage. And if you see the Anchorage, that's got a very sort of traditional style of architecture. It's a beautiful building. Um, it feels like downtown Fairfield, and it feels like a building should feel in downtown Fairfield. This building, because of its industrial antecedents because of its prior use is going to feel a little bit a little bit different it shouldn't be the same kind of building and uh, uh, I think I think I think what we're moving towards is going to be a great building if if um, we get permission to do it so with that let me turn it over to ceiling and obviously we're happy to answer any questions you might have Sorry, I'm still getting used to this in-person thing, so we report between the screen that I can't point to and board. So we'll do both. Do you want this? You think that'll be easier? It might work. It's not working. Maybe we'll just leave that and I'll... Um, oh, it does. Yeah, we'll do the board. No, we'll do the board. Okay. Thanks. So good evening. My name is Steven Potter. I'm a principal at Vinefield Architecture. Um, Pre-app meeting, I'll keep this brief, but please let me know if you have any questions or you want me to elaborate on anything. So we, when we started thinking about this site, and this is site here, um, when we started thinking about the project and the product we wanted to develop, we also took a look at your TOD study by the Gritty Clancy, 
and we looked at their design goals and what they were trying to achieve. And some of those goals were reinforced with meetings with staff. Uh, big picture, in short and very big picture, Billy Clancy was trying to create a place around your train station. That resonates with us. When we start projects with Andy, and any project we work on, multi-family projects, we think about how do we create a sense of place, how do we create a sense of community. Um, and that's important to us. And that, with that as a mission statement of sorts, with the background, we created four design goals, four primary design goals. And those design goals are add life and activity along Ash Creek, create a, the architecture that hints at more urban living along Black Rock Turnpike, create a space for public use that makes people want to come to this area, come to this place, come to this site, and we close a public area in this public site, and you'll see that in a second. And finally, create architecture that's engaging enough that it's your first view as you cross the bridge into Fairfield. Mm. So those are the four design goals. So just to orientate you, this is Black Rock Turnpike. This is Ash Creek. This is the entrance into, into the train station. The south part of the site, Ash Creek is down here, Ash, Ash Creek Boulevard. This is the site, this is the building outline here. This is the area around it, perimeter. That's what we focus our design on. So the first concept, which is uh, add activity and life along Ash Creek Boulevard in this area. The principal design concept was to take the pedestrian experience and move it up against the building. We've got a amenity space here, um, which is about 10,000 square feet. We've got a 6,000, and you'll see this in the plan. We've got a 6,000 square foot co-work space that will have public access. So this will read at the first floor like a public space. We, we take the pedestrians, we push them up against this, we have parking, and in front, in the area between this public space and the road, because it's a great change, and because it's a busy road, we figured that we could have public-like garden areas at the front. So hopefully we can create something engaging for pedestrians who really, probably really walk along this. But if they do, that softens the landscape between this and the building. I'll show you that more in section. That's the primary idea. Secondary, second, second concept, creating the hint of urban-like living along Black Rock Turn Turnpike, townhouses. You'll see this in some of our work. I'll show you that. We have direct entry living here. It looks less like an apartment building and more like urban townhouses. This will be the view that you see across from Black Rock Turnpike because this is a parking lot, very narrow. Unlikely we'll have a, a building there maybe soon, and they're going to need the parking for this brewery anyway. So you'll see that as you're driving up a, along Black Rock Turnpike. And you'll see in the plan another goal of creating this town -like, townhouse like element is to shield the parking behind it. So when you're driving around the site, this is important, you won't see the parking, the 200 or so, or 200 space or spaces, internal spaces, you won't see that. Um, third design goal, create a public space. We create a public space on this side, on the, on the west side of the building. This is front and center, because you'll see it as you come into the parking lot. Into, into the, parking lot. the idea here is to create a dramatic backdrop, a public space that has parking on it, so that creates a sense of life during the week. But on the weekends, for example, you could close it off, bring food trucks in. You could have public events there. And that's the idea behind that space. A space that's, that feels public and is also linked to, um, if you've ever been to the site, to the um, walk across the way along Ash Creek. There's a little walk that goes down here. So if we can get this um, preserved space and protected space, which is public, to feel like it's connected to this public space, and that's a win for our overall design concept. So just elaborating on those elements. Just ask a question. You said there's a walkway along there? Uh, there's, a, there's an existing walkway. Yeah, can I ask, why don't you switch with Mr. Montelli so we can have the uh, board facing this way so yeah, we can sure. help the public a little bit? Like that. 
um, put it on. Well, for yeah, yeah, I want me to hold. I want to show that. Loop. Yeah, for his question, ask answer. Sure, we Right. You can see there's a walkway. I see. That's yeah. existing. Then, uh, thank you. So, see, you want to stand here, and I'll hold the boards here. Uh, is that good, Chair? Yeah. Just, uh, if anybody member wants a public member of public in person wants to see it, slide over. Yeah, might be a bear chair. Yeah. Um, okay, that's fine too. So I'm on this one, Ellen. Commissioner Harrison. I have a question. This is so there's going to be a co-working space, as I understand it, and then residential units. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, will there be any affordable housing units here? Yes. How many? So, your TOD study calls for the percentage to be increased from your 10% mm -hmm. to 12%. And so, we would offer the 12% okay. in line with that. Okay. Thank you. And then, I guess, will there be any businesses? I mean, to me, I think of TOD. I, you know, co work, let me finish. Co working space is great, but what about stores? You know, things where that, you know, that makes that community vibrant. So that, that's one of the unique features that I was trying to mention about this property is that you know, unlike the development that's at the corner of Commerce and Black Rock Turnpike, which has got frontage right there directly on a busy street, you know, where Sally's is going and it's got that presence for retail. This site is doesn't have that. I mean, we don't have the frontage on Black Rock Turnpike. So we looked at the TOD study, and it's, it's funny. So the, the original TOD study, which preceded the 2019 TOD study, Commerce Drive study, talked about office and having large-scale office buildings. But one of the reasons you did the 2019 TOD study was the market clearly was telling that large office is, is, is not viable. We're almost trying to go back to that original one in a, what's a new way. I mean, one of the things that's happened since the, since the TOD study uh, in 2019 is obviously the pandemic, mm -hmm. which has greatly shifted things further. But interestingly, now we have the situation where we have a lot of people post-pandemic who are not are still not going back to work full time. A lot of people are going in three days, they're staying home two days to work. They're working from home. And so now there, while there isn't a need for a large scale office building, there is still need to work around where you live. And so I think that's what, and Andy can jump in here and want to add that, but that's where we thought this was a great opportunity because we didn't have the Black Rock Turnpike frontage that we could have a co-working space. And something to achieve that original goal in, in drawing, it would be a benefit not only to the residents who live there, but also all these multifamily residents that are in the area. That, okay, here's a place you could go to and work, live, eat, play, which was one of the original ideas in the, in the original concept that got changed with the what's happened to our scale office market. Uh, but, That's fine. And who owns that? Does is the owner of the building? Do we work space? Like, who owns the co-working space? Yeah. Um, um, Chris, just move the thing off the microphone. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Andy Montelli, Post Road. Um, we, we would own it. Okay. And we would run it as a separate little gotcha. entity. Okay. Yeah. Right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, and I'd just like to say, I mean, our goal is always to try and create some sort of vital, vital element programming at the lower floor. And if we thought a restaurant would work here, we would do it. And we've tried it in multiple of our yeah. multiple projects. Yeah. Andy has a coffee shop in a project in Boston, happened to work there. Uh, we have this 20,000 square foot restaurant coming up come up next door. That's a great amenity. It adds value to our project. No, but you don't, so that's not yours. That's sure. The but the value for the district is Right, I understand. Okay. And then just one more question. Will this... Is this near like any of the environmentally sensitive piece of land, Ash Creek? Like, how close is it? Well, across the street. Across, and yeah. will you are you working with conservation? <coughs> Have you had any meetings with them, or is there no interference? Well, this will be under. Um, I mean, we definitely have to work with the state on it, and uh, the Ash Creek that area is actually coastal. So deep will have to be involved in that in, as well. So, but have you have you any discussions with regards to the? The clean up there? We, we develop on urban sites all the time, and uh, unfortunately, most of them 
and we know about this going in, have significant environmental concerns and, and issues, this one does too. Mm -hmm. There's a reason. It, I mean, they made brass valves here. There's stuff in the ground. Um, we've examined it closely. We've had engineers, scientists study it. We know what's there, and we know how to fix it. It just takes money, and we've got that built into our budget. So we can remediate this site. And okay. when you talk about remediation these days, what's actually the highest level that you have to achieve is, is your bankers. Your bankers are all hiring environmental attorneys and, and checking your work. So we're very confident that, you know, what our plan will be will will um, meet every every state goal and state regulation. Thank you. Commissioner Francis. What kind of contaminants are you finding? Sand capping? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of, there's a little bit of uh, hydraulic oil from machinery that's leaked into the ground. Um, and and there's the byproducts of, of the machining process itself and then the casting process. But, but all, all stuff that, you know, is fixable with enough money. Yeah. And do you truck it yeah. somewhere to oh, a, thank you. a certain space? Or um, do you decontaminate? It, that, that's becoming very difficult to do. Very few places uh, are taking that kind of material today. So what the states allowed us to do is essentially to cap these sites. We designed the sites so that there's, um, you don't take any soil off. So we raised the, the site a little bit and we put a, um, you know, a concrete barrier that, pre that prevents anybody from coming in contact with contaminated soil in place. And, um, and, and that meets every state goal, and we've done this, you know, in Connecticut a number of times. And you said it already has a concrete slab. Would you have to destroy that to get under it? Yes. Oh. Yeah. We have, we, have to, we have to demo the old slab. And then um, one thing that CM would probably get to, but the, the, the floor of the site is basically our parking garage. And what we would do is build a, a steel deck above that whole thing, and then our units go on top of that. So the floor of the parking garage essentially becomes the cap, and, and that's what prevents um, any, any customer from coming in contact with any contamination. Commissioner Braun and Commissioner Brayman. Hi, can you hear me? <clears throat> Yeah. Looking at the aerial, the, the green area, is that part of your property that's between you and the the street that goes around the Metro Center parking lot? Is that part of this parcel? There's a pretty the southwest. wide so the green west, space. There? The west portion, the green area in the west portion of the concrete pad, yes. There's a whole can big... Can we point to that? Can you circle yeah, yeah. the green? Yeah, okay. right there, yes. Okay. That's so yes. Is the area also subject to the same contamination that you're talking about? Does that have to be remediated also? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, there's contamination, you know, throughout the site, and, and I believe there is some there as well. And um, the green space you're creating, though, will that be sitting on, because you're creating some green space that looks a lot smaller, but is that also sitting on top of a um, a cap of a, a electron, uh, what do they call it, an engineering membrane or whatever they call it in your new planting Correct. There's plant. There's a few ways to do it. And I, it sounds like you've seen this before. There's a few ways to do it. And one of those ways is a membrane. Um, so when you're outside the building, uh, a viable cap is a membrane and then everything that goes to the cap is sleeved and sealed. So if you have a light pole, for example, it's sleeved and sealed. Is that what is you're that doing in the green space? If we, we, I don't know if we've done the study, but if we have to, yes, we will. Yes, yeah. Okay, I think that was the question. That's all. Okay. Because I was hoping when you first started talking, it sounded so lovely, and I was going to talk about can you have plantings and trees and native plants, but now it seems like if it's well, we if the green space cap, you can't have anything that would have roots that would go through the cap, right? No, you can, and there's details, specific details for that. For example, a specific detail is a bulb. A, a bulb membrane. So basically, you dig a hole, you put the membrane in, 
create enough space for your bulb, your tree bulb, and, and its future roots, and then you fill. So you basically create a cap that goes around the tree. And is this and the same thing? That's been done before Andy done on his project. We, we actually, do you, have, do you have a picture of the uh, Corsair courtyard? We've, we've done this um, a number of times on projects where we've been able to create really uh, thickly landscaped courtyards and, and public spaces that um, are on, you know, areas that were contaminated. I was, was going to hand this out to you, um, but, um, you can see it. Is this the I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but this courtyard is one of Andy's projects, and those trees are, un are uncapped. Uncapped? Commissioner Braun, sorry, we're showing it here, but you, you can't see it. But Andy was involved in a project, uh, or is involved in a project, Corsair in New Haven. They have a courtyard in the center of that project that is heavily landscaped, but would be similar to what we would be able to do here in the landscaped area. My like sort of goal is to never lose green space from what existed before. I know it's probably compromised and it's obviously contaminated, but is your new green space going to be not very natural, not very native? It, it can't, it has to be living above a plastic membrane. I'm sure I'm saying it the wrong way. It's not really going to create green space. It's more like a park-like type thing. Like no roots can go down below the membrane, right? Green space. Put you two on the deck. Um, I, I, I'm sensing that you're, you're, I'm not sure this is your question, but can we create uh, a natural habitat, planted habitat above this cap? And the answer is yes. That'd it's just great. a question of where you place the cap. And then... The and, and we can show examples of that very easily in a subsequent, you know, submission okay. if you like. Yeah. Is this the same type of contamination that was in the Metro Center, the 30 acres, 35 acre site next door? It seems like it would have been, right? I, I have no idea. I haven't looked at that at all, no, to be honest with you. I'm not sure, sorry. Okay. Because um, I remember when they were, we gave them approval several, right before the pandemic hit to build apartment buildings, and there was an issue there of putting the footings or the foundation of the building below the membrane, so they had to have some kind of a, ne which would mean there would be contaminated soil, so they would have some kind of a negative air pressure pump in the basement of the building to prevent yeah yeah that's a very common yeah that's a very common technique right is that something right. you yeah. have to you don't have to it have and it's vented through the building well, oh, sorry so you're, you're speaking of the depressurization system that's underneath the slab and there's a pipe that goes connects from that above the roof of the building and exhaust and exhaust yeah. it would have do that because you're digging into because the the parking garage is forming the cap, right? It's, it's, it's literally depressurization, so that any air trapped down there that's causing pressure. And you know, I should be speaking like an expert. I meant not, but that was about. Yeah, yeah, let me let's see. Right. If I didn't catch it either, um, Commissioner Brown. Just. A few more questions on it is fine. I just okay. want to get back to kind of like the the presentation okay. overall. You just don't want to get too oh, much I into what would be otherwise an app application. Okay. This That's is fine. The, what? Uh, um, but it, please continue. But the one thing I was, the question I had, because she brought it up, uh, Commissioner Braun, we did have, and we kind of improved, at least in principle, next door, um, a, a project, uh, and what is it? I'm, I'm, the name's escaping me. Metro Center. Metro Center project. It had apartment buildings, if you're looking at it, all the way to the, at least looking at the screen, all the way to the left. Uh, a restaurant as you're coming into, um, what, Ash Creek um, to the left again before you make that turn, and even, I guess, a hotel and concourse. And you don't have to answer it now, but, you know, I want you to go through your presentation. I assume you've looked at that and that this is part of, you're trying to be a part of that project. Or at least kind of dovetail into it or complimentary. complimentary is a good way of putting it as well. I mean, are you familiar with the project and what at least that they had in mind as far as details? Do you mean the one on the other side oh, of Ash the Ash Creek? Creek? Yes. Uh, the lower yeah. portion, we've looked at it. Yeah. Okay. It's further away and it's got the uh, 
preserved area between it and us. There's no direct link, but no. But I think there was supposed to be a retail thing. Um, yeah. yeah, right where uh, Ms. Harrigan is uh, showing this cursor. Mm -hmm. So between that and the concourse and things like that. The, 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 oh, do you think? Are, are you referring to the previous developer of the same site? Yes. Am I? I think I am. There, 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 there's still a retail tab concept. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, um, the, those guys put that pad down without looking at where the easements are. Well, I'm not concerned about the pad. I mean, just the design principles in general that, you know, you, here you are, you, we have yeah, this. I think you're talking about the, a new project, the new one. So you're talking about the new project, right? Over here. So, Andy, right there. We, we know of, yep. uh, I'll just pick for closer. So we, sorry. Can I, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm John McFadden. I'm with Post Road. I'm at 249 Beach Road. Um, so the allied, allied Construction out of New Jersey okay. purchased that That's after it. the guys couldn't get it capitalized. They have a plan in place to, you know, kind of do a first phase of what's, what was approved. Mm -hmm. We're aware of that plan. We've looked through it, you know, extensively. The state lot between us is kind of a large buffer, but within the TOD study, we think that, you know, assuming they go forward with what was approved, which, you know, we've heard rumors otherwise, it'll all, we think, you know, blend okay. in a nice favor. I didn't mean to shortchange. I mean, please continue with your presentation with and, the thought that came up. And absolutely, we've, we've been talking to staff already about the experience all the way from uh, Oakings, from uh, so Kings Highway down that road, okay. what the pedestrian experience is. Just, just one, one other thing. Our, our civil engineer is their civil engineer as well as the civil engineer for the, for the uh, uh, group hub as well. So we've been oh, with the same helpful. people to try and for that. That's helpful. Uh, Lantech? Lantech yeah. Yeah. Peter Romano. Okay. Thank you. So I won't belabor this. Please ask questions if you will. And, all right, great. Thank you, everyone. Um, this is, these are sex site sections illustrating those three design concepts I was speaking about. Um, so the one is Ash Creek and creating activity on our building, bringing the pedestrian experience to our building. There's a great change. It doesn't look as much as it is here. It's about seven feet from the road to where this, the first floor would be here. And this is the park-like areas we're trying to create between our building and the street. I should point out there's some easements. There's a lot of easements on the site, and Andy's been and his team have been working through them. And some of those easements are right here, so we try to stay away from from that. Um, but we try to solve for the idea of bringing pedestrians to our building by bringing the sidewalk up. But this could still be a really engaging uh, public experience as you're walking across, walking along that road. This one, yep. This is the uh, second design concept of the townhouses. So what you're looking at here is two-level, a uh, multi-story unit, a two-level apartment. Here's the real, real apartment up here. This is just a liner to the parking garage that's behind. So we block the parking garage. We create front doors for those, uh, for those apartments. They look like townhouses. They look like you can walk out. You can. You can walk out uh, along the pavement. You can go to the brew pub. Um, grab a drink, get back in, without ever having to go into a corridor in the apartment. Um, again, it creates an urban feel. And you can show some examples of that. Yeah, we have. The, the first, uh, I think the very first image on your, on your sheet is the Autobahn in New Haven, uh, and we did exactly that. Okay. Um, and th and this, is, this is this important public space, and, and we see this as a partnership with the town, um, what can this space be? What can this public space be? Um, we created an architectural backdrop. Here you see what's essentially a green area with drives on either side because it's a loop. But you could close these drives down on the weekend. We don't need them because you can access the site without having to go through that loop. And, there, and you could have a food truck, for just for example, a couple food trucks up there. Um, we think that could create a sense of place. And then talking about the overall vision mm. of the site, this yeah. is a goody, an excerpt from the, uh, a couple excerpts from the Goody Clancy study. Um, you see what they're trying to do, right? They're, they're trying to line the streets, like um, the commissioner was just speaking about. Uh, there's the project across that we were uh, in this current form, but that's what we were talking about right now. And you're lining the streets here and trying to create an urban edge. Um, one really important but what seemed to us to be a really important goal was this is a gateway into Fairfield. What do you see? So they, they studied that, and they studied that in, in, in two 
on two pages in their report, and they took shots at what these buildings could be. They, they looked at those buildings, uh, sounds the, uh, the easements, though. There are easements all over the place. Some of those buildings can't be realized the way they're shown. This is what we're suggesting. We want to create architecture that says, hey, you've arrived in Fairfield when you, when you drive across that bridge. Um, very early on, years ago, we worked on uh, overall planning and design of uh, the Fairfield Metro site. Uh, we took a shot at the concourse building. We, the architecture we employed there was more modern, and we thought that was appropriate. Um, a more modern, more glazed facade. Uh, the architecture here is meant to be, tries to be dramatic. Um, it's cantilevered on one side, it's cantilevered at the front. It seems like a floating glass box. Um, that defines Ash Creek, that defines your view as you're coming across the bridge. And then it breaks down as you go back, back on the side to this more townhouse feel um, with those uh, direct entry units like I was speaking about. So it has, a, it has two lives along these two facades. And then on this side here, it's a large building, you want to modulate it. On this side here, we have complementary but not exactly the same architecture that breaks down to more of a brick block. I'll show you that. And what this does is hopefully create a backdrop for this public space. That's a common, common urban planning concept is when you have a foreground, a large urban space, and a backdrop. That's what this is. Now this is the view you'll see when you're driving to the park, into the parking lot. So we haven't hidden this public urban space. We've made, put it from the center of your experience as you're using the train station. Hopefully people get to realize it's there. They want to be there, they want to go to it, and hopefully we can activate it so that they will. Um, and then let's quickly flip to the plan so you understand understand how the building works. So simple metrics, um, the building's approximately 250 units, 248 stands, uh, 335 parking spaces, 232 in the garage, 103, 103 on the surface. The, the building is five stories and approximately 61 uh, foot tall right now. We haven't done the average grade calculation, we will. Um, the parking garage, and you'll see that in the next slide, is about 76,000 square foot, has a 76,000 square foot footprint, and the residential above 60,000. Um, so quickly, I'm not going to, I've discussed this before. This is the um, co-work space. This is the amenity space. Um, some townhouses on this side as well, with the same direct entry. The, I, the reason that you're only seeing this block on this plan is because this is at a lower elevation than this. The site drops off to the road. If you've ever been uh, to the site, you'll see that. So this is a slightly lower elevation than the garage behind. You walk up. How do you access? Uh, you access through Ash Creek? There's two access, one here and one here. Oh, it is off. It's off Ash Creek Boulevard. Yeah. yeah. And then we have a loop. So what this serves to do is it forms a loop here for this public space, right? So if you come into the co-work, you can park along the edge here mm -hmm. and go to the co-work or you can park in this area during the week. On the weekend, you could close that off, still have that loop, and make this a public space. You don't need the parking here. What is the blue line? What's the, line? Uh, the blue line is a flood, flood, flood elevation line. Oh, it's on all our drawings. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this is the uh, parking garage. Now this was this is an, an intentional move here. You see this purple, and you see this building. That's the existing building. I, we, I think we've planned it well enough that the sight lines from Black Rock Turnpike you won't see the garage because um, you brought the townhouses far, uh, down far enough as just about where the building starts here. Um, and that's what you're looking at. You're looking at a, a large uh, parking garage that's a great amenity for tenants. It's covered. Um, that's something that's important in luxury, in luxury apartments. Not everyone has that. Uh, and then we have a back of house space here uh, for, with, with parking, but an important point here is that it's an easement, a uh, pedestrian easement along the back of the site so that you can get from the train station across our site to the neighborhood. That will be preserved. Landscape, so it uh, it's doesn't feel like uh, a back door. It 
feels like, like a, an important experience to go from there to there. What's the ratio of parking to units or bedrooms or whatever ratio you have? Uh, we have oh, 1.35. Is that right? Sorry, that's okay. I can do it in math, but I forgot. That's fine. We're about 1.35 uh, spaces to units. Okay, thank you. So now we're above this concrete podium, we call them podium buildings, right, the parking is below. And these are residential units, the module gets narrower, and what that allows us to do is to create two large internal courtyards for the residents. Uh, a couple things here, it's a great amenity, um, and two, it elevates that residential experience slightly above the, the parking that, um, that is that belongs to the Metro. And I'll just, Would there be any public access to those two amenity areas? Probably not. That public access, the public access is downstairs here. These are these are for residents. So an important uh, I think comment about amenities. That's what I think we do well, and Andy does probably better than anyone we've ever worked with, is create great amenities. But creating great amenities is just a byproduct of the goal create communities. We find if you create great amenities, we create strong communities with higher attention. People feel like this is their home, not just somewhere they rent. They stay in the community longer, and we are able to support the local community with our product. So amenities is a way of, of creating the community that's really important to all of our projects. It's similar to what that Commerce Drive at Black Rock right? You know, there's the the public portion down there at the, at the ground level, and then there's that raised amenity there that's up there for the uh, for the residents behind the building. So again, large amenities and two uh, two amenitized courtyards. Um, the units just go up. It's double single double lower corridors. I just make a point about units. Um, along with Post Road, we're always studying how people want to live because that's our business. Uh, so whether these units will be adapted to what the market wants now, whether that's work from home space, whether it's uh, uh, spaces in the units that allow them to better better live in this post-COVID environment, now we're looking at that. Whatever those whatever that means for our units, we're always doing the research. And then finally, I think we'll just skip to the section. But this is the the building section, and what you can see on the left hand side, on my left hand, is that the, that the uh, public space along Ash Creek is slightly lower than the rest of it. And those are the two courtyards, um, and the idea is that that parking is shielded entirely, almost entirely from uh, Black Rock Sandpike and uh, Ash Creek. We, we uh, gave you a few of our projects that we've worked on together and separately, just to indicate that we have the experience in creating what we've told you we want to create here. Thank you. How large are the windows in the units? It looks like a lot of glass comes with the eastern sun. I don't know. So uh, our win the windows you see, those block windows, and normally it's like these, and like eight by eight or seven by eight. They're large. They are. I, we, I can go on. We will break in the next meeting about that. Yeah. <laughs> about uh, about where, about energy and and uh, healthy living, but more likely that. <laughs> no. You probably are going to have those. No, I don't. Time is fine. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. We have drop down sheds, yes. And we, we put those on the beginning. And so when I suppose. Solar. Solar. Uh, we, we will. The buildings that we're developing now in Massachusetts uh, have solar on the roofs. In fact, well, hell, uh, the anchorage on Uncawa were. were putting in $350,000 worth of solar panels right now as we speak, so that the solar there, the panels there, are calculated to just about 
cover our house bill, bill for the common amenities and the hallways and so forth. So, I mean, right, right in the center of town, we're putting up a big solar um, project. I noticed in the Audubon and New Haven, you, uh, you have some um, articulation of the facade it makes you know uh, makes it resemble you know townhouses um, and breaks up the, the the facade. Is that something that you could do uh, both on the, the brick the brick block, but also perhaps on the glass? Absolutely, and, and this is really early, right? So yeah. Absolutely, we can see here. And Andy already gave me instruction that he wants this one to be much mm -hmm. So it's more of an important corner than it's being like now. Mm -hmm. So yes, there'll be additional modulation to what you're saying. The majority of time so far has been on plan. Thinking about the experience that someone has if you walk by the building or you drive by the building. How we make the building feel interesting from the ground floor to the person passing by the person coming from Bridgeport into Fairfield, important entrance to the, to the town. Things like the, the design of the specific floor plans, you know, we haven't gotten there yet. But, um, Good. but we will if we get allowed to go forward. I want to bring it back to the POD at some point. But do you have yeah, just a couple of comments? Uh, I mean, I like the way you brought the building forward, uh, you know, to the uh, streetscape and hidden the parking. Um, in terms of the uh, along Ash Creek, is it possible to put in some sort of pedestrian walkway uh, similar to what uh, Attorney Russo may rec remember at one post road? I don't know if that's yeah, ever going to get built, <laughs> uh, but there was a pedestrian walkway right along the uh, uh, the coast there. Was there something like that could be on, on our side? Well, actually along the Ash Creek. Oh, along the Ash Creek on the other side. You know, like there's one leading up to it. I saw. We connect, we connect to that and what we've shown. Come on up. You want to come up? You got to come up, John, because you got to be. On plans that we discussed this, and actually as part of our you know, kind of diligence process, is walk the site, drive the site, bike the site. The other thing Andy didn't mention is how's the site looked on the train from people passing behind the site. Uh, so one one weekend, a couple weeks ago, I actually rode you know, a bike through kind of that path down to where it connects to our site. We talked about adding kind of protective, uh, protected bike lane as well as pedestrian uh, access from our site to the to the uh, path that exists today. <coughs> now, we're going to go if across, like you're saying, like on state property. I was property, thinking actually or, going along Ash Creek there. Yeah, I, you know, we we've had we're, we're three years into a what's called the Green District in Marlboro, Massachusetts, which is you know solar uh, high end lead certification and. We, we agreed to a, a process like that, and uh, it's a lot harder to get permission to do a public access on state land than you might think. Maybe not harder, but um, I'm not sure who's ownership. Yeah, and so I have to look at that. Building we'll something on property, oh, Is it's that actually right. state land right along the Ash Creek? I think off. Yeah, yeah, yeah so right, right off the, the road. road it is. The first bit is, but the existing path, you know, does have some, you know, tremendous boardwalks and kind of uh, observatory areas and stuff, and it's something we'll accentuate. And I think there might be a pedestrian bridge plan to the other side we were talking about. Yeah, Steve, I can just um, share that real quick. I don't know if this is helpful, but the, um, that's going to be coastal jurisdiction right up to the wall because of where the tide is. Mm -hmm. You can see it, that high tide goes up right up against that wall. Okay. So that would be a, that would be a state project okay. if that were something that, that were to happen. Any other questions, or can I just turn this what I, I think is a TOD, uh, the TOD uh, study we did? I suspect if you come to us with an application, you're going to have some regulation amendments, more than like, well, almost certainly, I think, to incorporate the TOD study. Correct. Do you anticipate anything that would be different than the TOD study, or in addition to, or anything? You know, for example, height. I suspect you're going to have you know, heights one. Height. Residential density. I think uh, my staff gave me some. Our staff gave right. me some things. Do you anticipate any regulation amendments that would be different than the TOD study in any of those kind of quantifiable metrics? Not with regard to I think hard standards. Um, not with regards to height and, and density, but with regards to the commercial 20% right 
Um, that's what I, that's think, I think. That in with the TOD, and I and I, I think Jim had pointed this out in, in the comments, but I think the way the TOD looked at it was as the district as a whole, and and the the split between residential and non-residential, and again with this site, there are some challenges because of its location, but we feel that we are trying to meet the intent of the overall district by one, providing the live portion, obviously, with the residential apartment units, but also with our amenity space and the co-working space in creating the, the work aspect. It was supposed to be, you know, eat, play, live, work, and, and that's the work aspect. So where something like a restaurant is difficult on this site, it's, it's really impossible. You know, we've tried to um, meet it, even though it might not be an eight yeah, point I, split. I get, I get that, and I, even for purposes of discussion, I'll accept the fact that a commercial uh, uh, use is probably is impractical, impossible. Mm -hmm. Not just because it's a hypothetical I want to take, but it probably actually is. Mm -hmm. But if we are going to be doing regulation amendments. It's going to be for like a di you know the district wide mm -hmm. TOD. So do you have things in mind to because I think the district it needs to have that commercial element, and I don't think it'd be smart. And you I mean you, you guys you're the one representing them and the application to get a regulation amendment, and then right. seek a variance and then right. come back to us. That's, no, that's impractical true. to you. Do you have things in mind for I don't know in, increased affordable housing? gets less of a commercial aspect. Um, more green space gets less of a commercial aspect. How are you gonna kind of get around this site's challenge this site's challenges with commercial, but still know that at least in this regulation amendment, potential regulation amendment, it's gonna have to have commercial. Yeah, and I think we we've been talking with staff about that, about appropriate language. But yes, the intent is to have to not come have to go pass a regulation and then go for a variance of it. But to have language where you feel it meets your it gives goal, some, it gives you some flexibility. Gives and we give you some flexibility. To, correct, to show how we fulfill the spirit of it, even though it might not be something where it's like, you know, 20% retail and 80% and residential. But I, 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 we have been working and talking with staff about language uh, that we think could achieve that. Okay. I mean, initial thoughts, and I don't know if it's even possible, you know, obviously increased affordable housing if possible, green space, trades here and there. Um, and I don't, you know, it's somewhat new to me to even think of anything outside the box, but I'll leave it to you guys. To and that's actually, it's one of the things we're working with the neighbor, too, in, in the conversations that we've had with the neighbor, too, um, because we, we want to create cohesiveness between their property and ours. Obviously, the residents are going to enjoy that. Um, and so that, there's also potential there to achieve some of the goals uh, that are in your TOD study. Okay. Aside from the commercial aspect, though, you, it seems like you've got the TOD study High in mind. Density, yeah. All the basic kind of metrics that we've looked at previously, I guess approved is not too strong of a word, but accepted, at least, mm -hmm. from the, or uh, accepted the recommendations, so we're not kind of reinventing the wheel or going off. Okay. We have to go through all that stuff. But. No, of course, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not going to hold you to it. Mm. Maybe, maybe there is something that comes up that you need an extra five feet in height, for example. I don't know. So mm. that's the whole point of this. It's supposed to be a uh, general outline. I mean, even the you know the TOD study talks about the unit counts annually expected. You know, 200 or what could be supported 224 to 264. You know, we're falling right in the middle of okay. that. So yeah, there there was a lot of. Uh, Andy and his team spent a lot of time going through the TOD study to make sure that we could come to you with an amendment and say, you know, we fulfill or we believe we fulfill. We can implement, so use this as a way of implementing the study, as a, but also being mindful of the challenges I guess you face, at least for the commercial aspect side of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Commissioner Braun. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, obviously you'll be getting something from conservation saying there's no inland wetlands on site. There are title on site, although I have a couple questions. Um, is any portion of the development within the tidal wetland setback? And also, what is the elevation of the land that you're developing versus the actual land where Ash Creek comes ashore? Like, is it up by like five or six, seven feet, or is, does it slope down? I thought I saw what looked like a yeah. seawall. So, I'll give you a 
we have asked that I have on the sheet here. I will, I will propose parking at 11 feet. I'll tell you what Ashley said. And we are, we're within the coastal boundary map. Well, as far as the resources, we'll have somebody who will prepare an application to list out the resources that are in the vicinity. For the coastal site so, review? Um, so I'll, yeah. I'm not sure with regards to the Ash Creek property across the road, but the road itself is at an elevation four. Um, our first floor is four foot above that for the, re for the uh, commercial part. And then about a, another four foot, but seven foot above that is where the parking garage starts. So the, ma the ma most, most of our building is about 11 foot above the street okay. alone, most of it. And the, the, the park-like area of green space, what's the elevation of that above Ash Creek? That's between four and five feet above Ash Creek. I'm oh, sorry, Ash, is, the, the road, right? Ash Creek Boulevard. Ash Creek yes. Boulevard. Ash Creek Boulevard. Yes. Road. Not, four, not five, Ash Creek itself. four to five feet above that. I meant the water, Ash Creek, the water. I'm yeah, not sure. we're not sure what that, we're not sure what that is. That's, that's, well, because I was expecting yeah, it. Commissioner Levy asked how to do with, I believe the the pedestrian pathway on the other site, Metro Center site, is along the Ash Creek water area, which is lower than all the development in elevation. It's closer to the water, I believe. Is that would if that connected to this, would this be have to climb up stairs to get to where your open space is, or would it go down along the river? Yeah, no, no, she's talking about the frontage. I, I, I. There's, there's, you, you won't have any stairs between Ash Creek, the bike path, and then the path that you showed. We'd have to create some elevational change in you know, ramps or stairs between the road and that public space you're talking about that we're creating. Is that what you mean? Um, I, I have to look at an aerial but, um, of the plan. But I guess my question is, you do show somebody fishing on, you know, on sort of a section of the yeah, park. I'm going to pull it up. Yeah. Yes. How high up are you vertically above the river, and how far in are your development activities from the river? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. You, you, want, you want the second bit? That's fine. Okay. Yeah. I don't know when we so, so that's oh. the park that oh. we are creating. This park. I would imagine. That's next to our building in that section, adjacent to our building, you don't see it there, is about four to five feet above the road. I'm not sure of the relationship to the water. I see it. So it looks like it's level with the road. Isn't that a car right in the middle? That, what's four or five feet above the road? Yeah, the car that's right there in the middle. Yeah. Well, I assume this isn't perfectly to scale. Yeah, this is, maybe we've taken some artistic liberties with this drawing, uh, but the section I showed you was more accurate. Right, right. Mr. Wyatt. Well, there's a lot of details that need to right. get be fleshed out for this yeah. from an actual application. One of the bigger, uh, in, in as the applicants or prospective applicants have discussed, is their intention to implement some of the regulations in the POD plan where there might be a departure from the strict recommendations of that plan is in, in, the, in the question, I guess, bigger question for consideration going forward, is there room to consider other ways to have other uh, site amenities or attributes that might credit towards um, the, uh, credit towards ameliorate against 20% of yeah. active commercial space? If that can't, if it's not realistic to be provided here because of the site uh, width in its location relative to other streets. Is there a, an opportunity to consider other site attributes that might be a great public amenity that offset the, the provision of that strict 20%? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, that, Jim. That, that's, kind of the, <laughs> yeah. that's kind of the bigger picture going forward. Is it, is it, is it worth exploring that uh, opportunity uh, uh, you know, down the road? Yeah. I'll uh, go down the line. Commissioner Harrison. Commissioner I don't have Harris. a question. You guys have been great. Thank you. And it's very visionary. Um, I would just say, you know, kind of talking, you know, piggyback on what you just said, Jim, like maybe we need to update our TOD study because it's kind of outdated at this point. 
given it was 2019 or 2022, life has changed drastically in three years. The way we live, play, you know, work, it's all changed drastically. Do you see that happening? Well, I, I don't know that we would need to revisit this stuff. We're not just for this in its in, in general. Right, but, but I think the idea of is, is we want to have a mix of uses, including commercial, and the study recognizes that not every single um, site or building should have commercial space in it, like the Metro Center the Project. The revisited Metro Center Project has commercial space, but it doesn't have commercial space in every single building. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the approach. And if 20, and, and, the, and the study recommends because of a five story construct that it makes more sense to make, you know, if it's one story over, uh, one commercial over four stories of, of residential, that it, it speaks to an 80 20 split. But is there, is there room to consider other things other than strict commercial occupancy yeah. in that non residential? Right. That's, okay. <coughs> Good. Thank you. Commissioner Brayman. Thank you. Uh, so uh, to, to Commissioner Harrison's point, we, we may want to address this in our PLCD, which is going to be revised, you know, mm -hmm. shortly. And, you know, if, if appropriate, we may want to comment on, um, you know, any tweaks or updates to the guidance from the 2019 TOD study, not necessary for different parts of different TOD areas in Fairfield in the new POCD. That's, so that's one issue that may provide you know, further guidance, which may even, you know, come out or be, um, you know, uh, discussed publicly before you would come to us with a, a full application. And then in, to the, the question that, you know, Mr. Went raised about um, whether, you know, our commission would be receptive to creative ways of meeting the 20% or 30% as um, recommended in the TOD for commercial space and you know, creating the, the idea being to create true mixed use, right? Um, I think, you know, for me, as long as uh, the, you know, the spirit of the TOD uh, is not uh, weakened or vitiated for the rest of the Commerce Drive district, right, so that you don't have uh, all of the developers now coming in saying, well, we want 100% uh, residential or we want 90% residential. Um, if it's tailored, you know, particularly if, you, if your text change is going to be, as, as all text changes are, tailored to your uh, demonstration site, um, then I think there is uh, room, at least from my perspective, there is room to work with those percentages. But I would hate for us to encourage uh, developers throughout this district to do away with true commercial uses on the ground floor. Yeah, we'll be careful. Understood. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, I'll keep going down the line. No Commissioner Francis, <laughs> Levy, I'll just say this. We have, we've been at it for almost probably an hour at this point. Um, I think the recommendation is like 30 minutes. Yeah, we've done a good job of that. But I think, I think this is important, and I hope yeah. you guys have... No, we, uh, we really appreciate it. The engagement we've had has been good, but I, I don't think we need to... I guess my point is I don't think we need to give anything other than probably thoughts at this point, Not maybe not asking questions unless it's, you know, important general stuff. But going down the line and giving our thoughts would be important. Commissioner Francis. Very creative plan. I like it, and I'm particularly attracted to the use of the public space. I think that holds a lot. Maybe even small concerts like we do at the gazebo. Uh, but it might be too noisy. I don't know. Are you reading our mind? That was one of the uses <laughs> we have in mind for, for that space. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. It would attract a whole different part of town, you know, rather than having to go to the center all the time. Right. Yeah. Very attractive. Thank you. Commissioner Levy? Yeah, I. I think I really like the uh, proposal. I appreciate your sensitivity to the site and the, you know, the use uh, and the problem with strict commercial and, you know, using the workspace uh, uh, instead. Uh, so I'm looking forward to your providing us uh, regulations or text amendment or guidance, which will give us flexibility so that we can preserve the overall intent of the uh, transit-oriented district and the balance of commercial and residential and yet allow something like this, which would be uh, suitable for um, this particular site, which doesn't uh, abut Black Rock or, you know, uh, commerce there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any thoughts, Commissioner Ford? Great. Commissioner Kett? Commissioner Braun, anybody else for the thoughts? Yeah. 
I realize there's no, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 I realize there's no inland wetlands on site, most likely, but conservation has another role also, which is advisory on the natural resources and open spaces of our town. It's not permitting, but it's advisory. And I do ask that you talk to them and have them weigh in on the entire park-like setting all the way down from the development down to Ash Creek, um, just to see what their advice and guidance is in terms of, uh, you know, the types of things you're planting and the impact on Ash Creek, the public access to Ash Creek, as well as the connectivity to the other pedestrian highway and the proximity to the future bridge. Also, when you come back to us, I would love to see when you do your renderings, it's really nice to have a rendering from different angles showing not just this structure, but in relation to all the other structures around it. And the aerial showing not just this parcel, but what is around it. So we know how it fits in with the community. Other than that, I'm very um, happy that you do have a large um, area that's open and out to the edge I see so often. So I appreciate that. I don't know what the color is of the building, but I hope it's not all gray. I hope you have some lighter, more attractive colors. Thank you. We're doing good. Uh, I mean, gentlemen, thank you. It's, it was a very exciting idea and prospect behind this. Um, I think I think I can say the commission is open to is open to this. The regulation amendments, the big one, I think, being a commercial idea. Commercial. Uh, we, as I said there earlier, it's important. I think you recognize that, but you're also the site may not be able to handle it. We'll have to work with you and think about how best to address it. I mean, I. Otherwise, I find this to be an exciting project between, uh, you mentioned the brewery earlier, between that, between yours, you did have um, the Metro project in your thing. Um, so between those three ideas, I mean, the, the trademark being done, right. you know, this whole area is being um, developed in a way I did not expect maybe five, 10 years ago. So um, I used to take Metro North a lot and uh, I didn't think there was much to be done in that site. So. I didn't either. Well, you said nine years. You didn't. Yeah, you you, you were, uh, you know, yeah. didn't think there was much there. So, uh, it's it's interesting to see the vibrancy of the town. Um, I think I've said this a few times with the brewery. I just find it to be a very interesting litmus test for how well the town is really doing. That you so between that and your project, and everything else going on. I mean, I think you have a receptive commission that would like to see this going forward. At least more details going forward, and we want to work with you. Um, Again, we'll do what we can with the commercial, and we'll see where we go with it. All right, great. Thank you very, sure. thank thank you very much. much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. thank you. Thank you for the presentation, the patience. Thank doing you with the time. I can run through the special permit standards. If you want. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. It. Have a good evening. Okay. Going on to public hearings. Zoning regulation amendments, application of the economic development to amend section 12.3.15, and 28.6.12 of the zoning regulations regarding outdoor dining. Thank you for staying with us. Sure, no problem. Uh, good evening. For the record, uh, my name is Mark Barnhart. I'm the Director of Community Economic Development in town. I'm here this evening on behalf of the Fairfield Economic Development Commission that has uh, uh, proposed, uh, resubmitted an application for your consideration to amend our uh, regulations related to the provision of outdoor dining. Um, if uh, this sounds a little bit familiar, it, it is. <laughs> I've, obviously been here before. We've talked about this issue in the past. Um, I think uh, the last time we were here, we uh, at that time the state was considering uh, a special act that would extend the temporary authorities by which many restaurants, uh, those in Fairfield and throughout the state, were able to create outdoor dining in an expedited fashion. And uh, I think, you know, at that time, 
Uh, the Commission raised a number of questions and asked that we do some additional uh, research and report back uh, later this year and uh, present uh, those findings to you for your consideration. But the urgency of that matter was, was obviously less uh, given the fact that the state had extended the temporary uh, provisions through uh, um, early next year, March of uh, 2023. So, I do think it's helpful to just review uh, a little bit of the background as to why we're proposing these changes. Um, it goes without saying that the past few years have been uh, challenging, to say the least, uh, for many small businesses, um, not the least of which uh, restaurants. Uh, restaurant tours, like uh, all small business people, entrepreneurs that I'm familiar with, are very, uh, very resourceful and resilient a lot. Uh, they certainly had to, uh, to adapt and change in order to survive during the pandemic. They certainly, uh, many took advantage of the flexibility that the state and local authorities granted with regard to the provision of outdoor dining. Uh, state and local governments obviously took extraordinary measures during the peak of the pandemic to ensure the uh, survival of restaurants as well as other small businesses. Uh, so since May of 2020, under those measures promulgated uh, through executive order and then through special act uh, and local authorities, Fairfield restaurants uh, were able to establish new or expand existing outdoor dining areas uh, through an expedited permitting process. Uh, they didn't have to make provisions for additional off-street parking. In some cases, we had restaurants that created uh, those outdoor dining spaces in existing parking lots effectively reducing the number of off-street parking uh, spaces available to patrons. Um, we've had a long history in Fairfield of supporting outdoor dining. We've had provisions in our regulations allowing for that for some, some time. Um, but, you know, with the pandemic, uh, given these temporary authorities, we had a number of businesses that uh, took advantage of that flexibility, uh, 29 of which uh, established new locations. We had 47 restaurants overall that uh, did submit uh, temporary uh, app or applications for temporary dining locations. Um, the result of that has been uh, generally positive, uh, I'd say overwhelmingly positive. Uh, it's been welcomed, uh, the growth of outdoor dining has been welcomed by restaurant and the public alike. Uh, certainly folks have taken advantage of that opportunity uh, to dine outside as well as support an industry that's been hard hit by the pandemic, and we had uh, we did a survey to, to ascertain what the impact of that was amongst our restaurant operators, uh, and three quarters of restaurant operators credited outdoor dining as being crucial to their business's survival, and more than eight in ten of our respondents uh, expressed interest in uh, making permanent some of those changes. So that that's what brings us here uh, again uh, before you this evening. Um, and while you know, COVID has thankfully receded uh, to some extent, and, and most of them were still with us, obviously, but uh, the crisis seems to have ebbed. Uh, but we have a lot of businesses that continue to feel uh, the effects of supply chain disruptions, staffing issues, uh, inflationary and increased cost of, of not just labor, but supplies. So all this continues to have an effect on restaurants and other, uh, other small businesses. So with that as the backdrop, uh, the Economic Development Commission um, back in January had considered uh, the results of our survey, looked at, at uh, some of the feedback we had received, and asked me to submit to you some proposed tech changes to, to the commission uh, with respect to outdoor dining. And uh, again, as this commission considered them, again, we had the backdrop of similar legislation at the state level that would essentially uh, provide a temporary, continue that temporary authority for another year. So um, the commission uh, denied it without prejudice so that we could get some additional information. So some of the concerns that I heard when we went back and looked at, um, you know, have you talked to, and we, we certainly did, but you know, will you specifically reach out to police department, other regulatory authorities? We talked to the uh, Fairfield Chamber of Commerce. How do they feel? How do other businesses that are not restaurants feel about uh, these changes to our outdoor dining regs? And, and so I believe we did all that, and um, I'll, I'll go through that in a little bit. But the, 
briefly recap, we have you know, a couple of changes that we were seeking initially, um, one of which is to eliminate the requirement that three quarters of the customer seats be located within an enclosed building, uh, which you find in numerous sections of our, of our regs. And then we propose to increase uh, from 150 square feet to 575 square feet, the size of an outdoor dining space that's permitted without the restaurant having to provide additional off-street parking. Now, in both instances, if you accept these changes, these would still require a compliance application to the commission for your consideration. So you'd have an opportunity to review the site plan and prove that. For restaurants that are not, that were not formally permitted, but you know, exercised or took advantage of the temporary authority. If they're now seeking to uh, make permanent those changes, if you will, they would still need to come before the commission for a compliance application. In addition to that, you know, we're, we're certainly mindful of the fact that there were restaurants that did take advantage of, of this temporary authority and created outdoor dining spaces in some very unconventional spaces, uh, areas like parking lots. And some, you know, arguably have, have worked very well. We haven't had any really, we haven't had any adverse uh, effects or uh, negative feedback with respect to it. But, you know, with respect to that, those temporary authorities are going away. But we think it's important that we provide a mechanism by which a restaurant can petition this commission directly. And with, after a public hearing, you know, during which they would present some information, evidence to you that, supports the adequacy of parking and other considerations on site circulation, you could approve that. Um, obviously, that's a higher level review. It requires a special permit, would require a public hearing, but we think it's important that we don't necessarily go back to square one. If a restaurant can demonstrate that it's working fine, you're convinced that the parking is adequate on site, site circulation is fine, uh, it's safe for both uh, pedestrians, the patrons, vehicular access, and the like. They should have a case. They should be able to make that case and be approved on a case-by-case -case basis. So, that, in essence, are the are the two changes that we're looking for. And again, I would I would stress or the three changes that we're looking for. I would stress uh, in the in the first instance where we're looking to uh, change the provision as it relates to the amount of uh, space that needs to be within a, an enclosed building, as well as increase the square footage by which restaurants can provide for off-street parking, um, an allowance for off-street parking. In both instances, it would require a uh, compliance application to you. Um, the other changes are essentially things that the Commission has traditionally imposed as a condition of approval. There is some language in 28.6.12 that refers to a dining season. <clears throat> Again, what we suggested before, and I think you, you, you've considered previously, is that we've seen evidence of that. We've had, a couple weeks ago, we had a 70-degree day in November. That's certainly outside the traditional uh, outdoor dining season. And when that's the case, if people want to dine outside, I think we should let them. So um, uh, other than that, I, I, I think um, I'm happy to answer uh, questions you have. I, I will note that, you know, again, Based on uh, your, your questions uh, during the initial hearing, we went back and asked the uh, police department, fire department, health department um, to comment on our proposed changes. Uh, those are part of the record. Uh, we also talked, uh, reached out to the Chamber of Commerce, other businesses in town, particularly those that are located in close proximity to restaurants with outdoor dining spaces and asked them how they felt and all those uh, businesses, in fact, all those responses indicated that they were supportive uh, of, of these changes. So, uh, and we also asked the public. Uh, so we did a petition at one point, um, and we advertised through the First Select Woman's newsletter, uh, put in a couple of restaurants that were willing to, to do that, and we collected, you know, in a, a few weeks, collected over 1,400 signatures in support of this. So I think you know, these changes are relatively modest in scale, but I do think they would have a significant impact and they would signal to restaurants that we not only can talk the talk, but we can walk the walk in terms of supporting them, um, responding to patron uh, demand and interest, as well as allowing them to remain economic competitive. So for those reasons, 
I'm here on behalf of the Commission to ask you uh, to approve or support uh, these changes. So with that, I'll entertain your questions. Commissioner Harrison. Um, thank you. And I think back, I think this was last April, we had this on the on the agenda. And March. I phrased, okay, March. I phrased it that I think it's, it's a great idea. I'm very supportive of our restaurants, uh, certainly. Um, I don't think this is in the record, but I think there were some, I think, Jim, maybe you mentioned there were maybe some calls as it relates to public safety. Maybe is there any, I know there's not a big record of accidents, but can you talk about any of the public safety issues that we haven't addressed? Well, only anecdotally, I'm not aware of any. We've had almost none in uh, calls in terms of complaints or otherwise, public safety or or, or otherwise. But as is in the packet in the in the uh, that's in the link to these materials, in what we had sent you, I think, a couple of weeks ago, uh, is Mark reached out directly to the police department to get their take to what their experience right. has been to see if they've got a. a a litany of complaints, and the answer to that is no. They 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 think it's generally been working well. Okay. Great. And then when you reached out to different stakeholders in the community, Mark, did you reach out to like any seniors who may have any issues with traversing on the sidewalk because there's you know more square footage of dining area? Is that right? I, I didn't talk specifically to seniors okay. about that. Um, you know, again, if there's a, I think we need to make sure that when you have an outdoor dining space, there's adequate pedestrian. Uh, passageway there, and that that can be enforced by existing zoning authorities that are there. They can't block a sidewalk and prevent people from traversing the sidewalk. Right. And I know that's an issue that we've had right. uh, with some restaurants that occasionally they encroach a little bit, and they have to be told that you know they have to pull that back in. Right. So, and I did speak anecdotally. I have a I have a family member who his family has had a business down there and on Post Road for over a hundred years, and. He's actually, it's a retail store, a jewelry store. He told me that more people, he gets more people from outside of Fairfield that come to a store now because they're here because of the restaurant. Um, because I had some concerns that maybe would negatively impact some of the retail stores, you know, fighting for parking spaces and whatnot. Um, so I was happy to hear that report. Um, all right, that's all the questions I have for now. I think I'll have more though. Commissioner Braun. So, um, how it would work with when you have the park the um, seating within the parking lots, whether they're already doing it now or whether they want to do it in the future. Either way, would they have to apply for a special permit? Like right now, we still have yes. the state. Yeah. Okay. So anybody who's doing it now under the state. So once permit, once a once a temporary I'm sorry once the temporary authority uh, by which they're operating goes away, that would require a special permit to you and a public hearing. To do that, to occupy a parking lot for that purpose. Okay. And um, in terms of reaching out, I see you have a petition with a lot of names on it. Was there any special, aside from the Chamber of Commerce, was there any other special effort to try to reach out to other businesses? I'm, I'm very happy to see the non restaurant businesses uniformly or unanimously all support this because it helps drive pedestrian traffic. Was there any other special outreach to reach out to more non-restaurant businesses? Or how, do we know that we have a pretty good sampling of, of them? Yeah, I, I, tried to, I tried to reach out to a diverse array of non-restaurant businesses located in different parts of town, but um, that were in close proximity to uh, restaurants with outdoor dining spaces to some extent. Uh, it's obviously not. <laughs> By no means exhaustive, uh, but at a certain point when I kept hearing the same information and to uh, Commissioner Harrison's point, you know, what I was hearing was it helps drive foot traffic. We're seeing increased foot traffic. It helps bring vibrancy and that, and we see that as a positive. You know, I, I didn't feel the need to keep going out and asking more uh, to get the same level response. I was pleased that you found that businesses are seeing that, you know, that uh, cross pollination, if you will, of um, of of business activity. And one last question, and this might be for Jim. The change to twenty eight point six point twelve um, basically puts all of this subject to just a compliance application. It takes out the word commission, but don't we also approve compliance applications sometimes? How does how does that work exactly? Yeah, I don't have the specific language in front of me, but the intent here is you know before. 
COVID, before the pandemic, uh, any seasonal outdoor dining application um, is, that was subject to that section, where the first 150 square feet is, uh, doesn't require parking, was a zoning compliance application. And I have here the inventory, if it's beneficial to the commission, of all of the sites that the commission had previously approved. Um, so that, we're not looking to change that process. Um, the, the, the only thing that's proposed to be changed is to increase the square footage that doesn't require additional parking amongst some of the other elements that, that Mark has presented. But the mechanics of how a restaurant would get approval once the COVID protocol allowances sunset would revert back to the way they were before. It would have to be on a commission agenda with a site plan for you to consider um, all of the uh, elements oh. in the typical conditions. Takes out the word, with, yeah, commission, yeah. Uh, what, what words, uh, let me just get what you there so I can understand what you're saying. I think, I think the intent would be that for the initial approval, the commission would consider that as a zoning compliance application. As the applicant, I will say that for the record. The recertification, and I may have added to the confusion here, the recertification I, I thought we were discussing as possibly just being handled administratively as opposed to putting it on the agenda for Is the commission. But honestly, okay. if, the, if the commission feels like it'd be best that both the initial application as well as recertifications be done through the commission, uh, I think we can live with that. Well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I don't see recertification on this printout, so maybe if it's somewhere in some other regulation that we don't see, maybe that could just be clarified next time around so we know exactly what what the change would be. I don't have a problem with recertification once it's certified the first time. The first time, even though it's just a zoning compliance app, that would still come to the commission because in this thing it says the word commission yeah. gets off. Okay. I, I, yeah, I'm looking at what you're saying now. In 28.6.11, okay. there's a strike through by the commission. Um, so I think we would eliminate that strike through and keep that language because the intent is that the commission is still going to be, uh, this is not going to be a, an, a, a, an, an over the counter permit, if you will. Okay. It would be something that would be on the commission's agenda like all the others have been in the past. And maybe recertification could be, is that in our regs now? I seem to remember there was some stuff uh, about this. Brexit. No, the, sta the standard conditions of approval that have evolved uh, are, are not, don't have any basis in, in uh, they're, they're not referenced specifically in the regulation other than in Section 28 references seasonal. In the conditions of approval that have been consistently applied or the season runs from um, April 1 to the end of October, um, it becomes kind of self-policing at, at, at some point. Um, and a limitation on uh, outside music and um, no additional signage and furniture generally being removed in the off season. Those type, and, sub, and, and then adding on subject to annual recertification and what we have done um, rather than relying on the individual restaurants to seek recertification, we would typically on mass sometime uh, before the season present the commission with, here's our inventory, here's the roster, Meg's holding it up, um, are we recertifying? We're suggesting that we may not necessarily have to wait. What I'm suggesting is mm -hmm. if there's an issue with a particular restaurant that has been approved for outdoor dining, we shouldn't need to wait for a recertification process if there's an issue that we can address through other enforcement mechanisms. And we've had the ability to do that, um, you know, going as far as um, you know, suspending liquor permits, which uh, we've, we've had to do on only one occasion, but it has great effect. So the message is regardless of the language, and we can clean that up, is the intent is that the commission would still have the authority to say yay or nay to any of these, and then allow a higher level of review in a case where somebody might want to occupy existing parking space. Okay, thank you. That's great. Commissioner Kett, and then Commissioner Francis. Yeah, I just had two comments about um, accessibility. One, when you're talking about the encroachment, it doesn't happen often, but I know at least one restaurant where um, I don't know if you want to have a provision that for any um, dining, outdoor dining, that abuts a pedestrian walkway, that that is 
has some sort of hard barrier between the walkway and seating, whether it's like a rope, you can even something as small as a rope or a planter, just so that if someone's trying to navigate the sidewalk in a, say, a motorized scooter or a wheelchair or in crutches, it's uh, not a trip hazard and they're not having to ask permission to get by. Um, and the second would be for uh, park, uh, parking lots. Um, if they're going to be using a parking lot to make sure that no accessible parking spots are taken over by, by the CA. I'm thinking specifically of um, uh, Little Pub. I know some of their, mm -hmm. their parking lot is now being used. I think one or two of those spots used to be accessible spots. Um, and, and the only thing I would... So not all of these, uh, obviously, I think would would pass your review. I, I would suggest that uh, if if a restaurant um, were to propose um, an outdoor dining space in a parking lot, and they weren't able to address how they're providing for um, parking, accessible parking, or providing other measures that would meet your level of of review, then you would probably not approve those. Uh, I, I do think that where it, in, it entails, and there may be there may be cases where they, they work per perfectly fine, but that should be reviewed on a case by case basis. But we we thought it was important that we at least provide a mechanism, mm -hmm. explicitly state, you know, what's the process by which uh, a restaurant could petition to do that. Commissioner Francis. Um. I do support maintaining the annual approval because um, it, it gives us the opportunity to say any um, alert the staff of any problems we've encountered with accessibility on sidewalks, particularly probably more than lack of parking. Um, and Mr. Webb, what's our parking space? What is a, what? How, how big is a parking space, or or what do we demand of, yeah. for restaurants? Typically, restaurant parking is one parking space for every forty square feet of patron space. And I, I think this is a good idea because you know we all use these restaurants all the time and certainly support them. Um, but I think the increase in size from 150 to 575 is enormous because it's going to impact um, pedestrian access a lot and, and parking, which we have so much in this town anyway. Um, but those are the, the two points I would want to see. I, I do like the annual recertification by the board where we can look at each restaurant and go, no, I'm constantly seeing problems with this or that. And, you know, the time doesn't really matter. It's just when it snows, once it snows, get the, the tables and chairs out of there because um, clearance is of primary importance. I mean, sidewalks are for pedestrians, and we have to be mindful of that. I think that's all for right now. I think just if I can respond quickly, um, I have we have no issue with any of that. Keeping an annual recertification is not a heavy lift. That's just our burden, not the applicant's burden. Just to every whenever uh, in March or February say here is the list and what I've provided for you. I uh, tried to update the inventory as best I can. There have been a number of name changes since the last inventory was produced. So the first two pages of this, and I'm sorry, Kathy, you don't have it, and I'm sorry I didn't email it, but uh, the first two pages of this are the existing, or the restaurants that had commission approval, previous commission approval um, um, for space, and the, the second two pages are the restaurants that availed themselves of the COVID protocol opportunity. Some of these restaurants have already removed some of those Spaces. They're not using them anymore. That's the minority. Some are going to want to keep some measure of it going forward. The ones that are highlighted uh, are restaurants that are both previously approved and expanded their footprint of outdoor dining. 
But again, to go back to the issues, and, and we agree and are sensitive to the issues of accessibility and having adequate um, public sidewalk pass, passage, um, but that, I go back to this is going to be a, a, a process by which they have to provide those plans to you so you're also satisfied that they are providing adequate access uh, for, um, uh, you know, for that. And, and you'll have the opportunity to, to review each, each of those as they, as they come forward. So it's not, uh, I just want to reiterate that, yeah, we, the, the state gave great latitude and allowed us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise have permitted uh, throughout this pandemic, and we're just trying to capitalize on some of those things that we thought worked uh, to see if we can't create that opportunity going forward. I, I'm not sure if I asked this previously, but the increase to the 575, was there, what was the basis for that? I mean, was it so we looked, at, air, was it yeah, so we looked at uh, we looked at the restaurants that had been approved uh, for temporary, either a new uh, temporary outdoor dining location or expansion of those, and and those that had uh, most most we had a, a calculation of the square footage. The mid the midpoint was was roughly 575. Uh, the med the mean, uh, not not the average, but the median. The median, median was yes, uh, 575. Okay. The mean was a little lower, 500 square feet. So uh, we took the, we took the um, midpoint. I mean, the regulation with that increasing it to 575, we are essentially increasing the patron that they're allowed to have. So if they were able to do 10 before outdoor dining, with the previous outdoor dining, maybe add a little bit more because it was only 150, I think, square feet. 150. Yeah, now we're allowing them to do more, which would just allow them to have increased patronage. Theoretically, uh, although our experience has been that, you know, when it's nice weather, people choose to dine outside, and when it's not so nice weather, people choose to dine inside. Typically, yeah. you don't see 100% indoor as well as outdoor. I suppose okay. it's possible, but that's not been our experience. So, And we um, haven't had too many, I mean, we haven't had any major stakeholders or Evidence, or I mean, I imagine every once in a while, parking though. That you know, Saturday night, Friday night, parking is hard to come by. Generally, that has not been a mass, a major complaint that we've heard from stakeholders. No more than, no more than usual, because uh, you know, I think one of the one of the benefits of having a downtown is uh, is you have if you if you strictly applied zoning principles now you wouldn't be able to create a downtown like we have today so we we allow for shared parking we allow for public parking to help satisfy a lot of restaurants downtown exist by dint of some type of variance for parking for the off street component so I, I don't know that we necessarily see have seen any increase in in that um, you know restaurants and all business owners themselves have a vested interest in providing adequate parking for their patrons and if they don't, then people are going to have to choose to go someplace else with their with their business. But so, you said though, like no more than usual. It's more just like we've always had parking. We've always had people that have complained that I can't find parking downtown. Any uh, I don't think that that's increased over the last three years during the okay. pandemic. Um, it's it's an issue, but I think it's a good issue, and we wouldn't want the alternative, which is to have a business with a giant parking lot around it to make sure that everyone has parking at all times of the day. So there's times, certainly um, peak times, Friday, Saturday nights, like you said, mm -hmm. where I think you do have to hunt for a parking spot. You may not find a parking spot next to the business that you wish to, to patronize, but there is parking available downtown. I have never experienced that, and I think most people, it, it does require a little effort, but you do eventually find a parking spot somewhere nearby. Um, but that's the case in any downtown, any healthy downtown, you have an issue in terms of, because that's what makes a downtown a downtown. Okay. I mean, I don't think it's mutually exclusive to have outdoor dining and then, you know, um, with no parking versus the opposite of that. But it's helpful to know that in your research and in doing this, you've not, yet, in comparing previous uh, years with parking, you don't see that 
there doesn't seem to be a cor enough of a well. I don't want to say that. there doesn't seem to be a correlation to an increase in parking issues with outdoor dining. Oh. It just seems to be a you know, constant take, issue. You know, take my word for it. I asked the police department and others well, yeah. that do this. I'm not, well. I'm asking not just you personally, but just in your research and doing this and presenting it. Uh, so I didn't get the sense of it in reading the materials either, but I also wasn't you know. I did not hear from businesses, from the chamber, from other regulatory agencies that parking was a, was a long-term issue because of outdoor dining. Did you have a question? Yeah, I did, and I've, I've brought this up before. Thank you. Um, I looked through all the letters from the different agencies here in town. Um, I just didn't see anything from the bike pedestrian committee. Um, Fair, I mean, Fairfield, I love. It's, it's a great, it's walkable, and it's, you know, people can bike around. And I imagine this might, you know, have implications on, you know, their mission. So what was, so did we reach out to them? I asked Mr. Wentz about that I think a few meetings ago. And I did not. I confess I did not talk to the bike pet committee, although I have met with, the bike, I met with the bike pet committee on another uh, number of other issues, yeah. but this did not come up. Well, I like, I mean, before I render a decision, I personally would like to see feedback from them, whether it's good, bad, or negative, I, you know, whatever. So let's do that. I, I can try to do that. I, I, we did not reach out to them directly, but I know there are um, members of that committee that are on our uh, agenda distribution list that get emailing of the agenda. So to the extent that they're peripherally aware of that, but we can do we, we can try to uh, um, reach out to them directly to see if they have any issue with this proposal. I mean, if we're doing diligence with the chamber, we've done we've called businesses up. We can't call this group up, but just. Seems like a mess to me. But I don't know. Well, there's lots of groups that you know. I'm sure that we didn't touch everyone. But on the other hand, we did publish it several times in the newsletter saying we're we're proposing this. Yeah. We've, and there's been news articles about it. So I haven't heard from the other from a bike head or other groups saying this is an issue. We have really serious reservations or concerns about it. People are busy. It's hard, and if we can reach out to them, we can. I mean, it, it's a town application. Right. Um, we can reach out to another town agency. It's not a typical private application where there's, a, um, you know, an issue of, of after you know post hearing uh, communications. So we, we can certainly. Uh, uh, I think know this group. I and, and I don't know why they didn't come to you for whatever reason, but I know they do. They, they value their mission statement of making Fairfield walkable and, and bike friendly. So I just think that their voice indeed. is important. We're happy to reach out to them. Any other member of the commission have questions? Right. Hearing, seeing none, thank you, Mr. Barnard. We'll at least initial presentation. I figured you have. Oh, yeah. I'm going to public comment now. Oh. Sorry. Sorry. No, for the initial presentation. <laughs> um, Tony Green, come on up. Thank you very much. If for any, because there's nobody else. In person, uh, any member of the public who is, is there anybody online, uh, Ms. Harrigan, besides uh, uh, Commissioner Brown? I'm good. Well, I'll, I'll say it for the record if any member of the public is joining us remotely or on telephone, if you can please, uh, if you're remote, please sign up in the chat room. If you are telephone, uh, at some point after uh, Attorney Green speaks, I'll ask you to unmute yourself. Attorney Green. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission staff. My name is Joel Green. I practice law in Bridgeport with the law offices of Green and Gross, and I reside at 52 Stonely Road in Fairfield. I was here tonight mostly on the 81 Black Rock Turnpike application. I represent the owner, and I was curious as to the plan, and I thought that was pretty exciting. Uh, but I addressed the Commission in the spring on this application, and let me preface my comments by saying that I appreciate the efforts of economic development, Mr. Barnhart, Mr. Went, and everyone, and I applaud everyone's efforts to, we all want to support restaurants in Fairfield, and, you know, we are known now as a town that has this vast array of restaurants and, uh, and different dining options, and we need to support that. But when I addressed you in the spring, I sort of suggested that we needed to do a little bit more of a thorough analysis as to what this all was about and what the potential impacts were. And 
So we made some progress, and I know that, that we have the letters uh, from uh, police, fire, and the like, and you know, sort of some of the public safety. Uh, I didn't think that, you know, the petition is sort of interesting because I'm not sure it was very scientific, and I'm not sure it offered those who had concerns about it an opportunity to chime in, but I don't blame, you know, it's fine, and I understand, and understandably, there's support for our restaurants, and uh, but you, as a commission, have always been thorough and thoughtful in adopting regulations and thinking about the regulations you adopt. And Section 8-2 of the Connecticut General Statute sets forth all of those kind of standards and uh, sort of themes that you need to think about as a commission. So I didn't really prepare a presentation this evening, but what I really did is at 5 o'clock I jotted down a bunch of questions that I had, and I just want to offer these questions, and I'll do – I'm not going to – I'm going to try not to editorialize too much about these questions as I put them before you, and I think some of them were answered by the presentation, but some of them weren't. So in no particular order, uh, first of all, my first question is, and I, I know the answers to some of these, but I'm just throwing these out for your thought. First of all, the, the new regulation talks about restaurant and other food service establishments. That's not really defined <clears throat> well-defined in the regulations as to what restaurants are and what other other food service establishments are. They're referenced in um, Section 12 of the regulations, but it's not they're not really well-defined. So this this these proposed amendments are are very broad in their application because they apply to all these things that are known as restaurants or other food service establishments. There is some distinction in the regulations about takeout. I think take out only, but something to think about. I was curious as to how many restaurants and other food service establishments presently exist in Fairfield. So kind of what's the potential impact in terms of uh, the scope of this thing? I asked, uh, and this was asked by the commission, what are the current parking requirements for restaurant or other food service establishments? Mr. Went was, you know, the regulation does say one space for every 40 uh, square feet of patron floor area. So what's happening here is you're being asked by adding this 425 feet to basically allow uh, to waive 11 spaces or to create a uh, patron floor area without 11 spaces. And your regulations express what you think is just fair and reasonable. And this commission generally feels, based on the regulation, that you should have a parking space for every 40 square feet. So by enacting this regulation, you're basically to whatever restaurants or other food service establishments take this up, you're sort of throwing them 11 spaces. And uh, based on the Pizza Co. application, I think they had like over 30 seats in that dining room of, you know, some 400 or I don't know how many feet it was in the end, but uh, just a thought. Um, I had asked uh, how many restaurants or other food service establishments presently offer outdoor dining. I think that was addressed tonight. Uh, now, this is something that you really ought to think about. And it was, pursuant to the proposed regulation, may restaurants and other food service establishments be created that have no indoor dining of any kind. So you're being asked to waive the having three quarters of the seats indoors. So by waiving that, does that mean that restaurants can be established that have no indoor dining? So there would basically just be a kitchen, outdoor dining, and no parking requirement. Because if you're 575 feet or less, then you have no parking at all. So is that something that this commission, I, I mean, I, and I think it's just a thought. In other words, you don't have to have any indoor dining. And um, I get to this later, but has anyone thought about how commercial landlords might feel about that? Uh, because we have a lot of space in our town that is presently occupied by restaurants. And is this commission basically sort of diminishing the leasing of indoor space through this regulation? Um, I then ask, uh, let's see. Uh, your thought of that, though, is what? That you have a, 
a building of you know, 500 square feet that ha is able to take account of an extra 575 that the landlord should be maybe asking for more? No. What I'm saying is where a landlord presently has a 2,000-foot tenant, potentially that uh, space, that indoor space, would not be a restaurant anymore. The kitchen could be maintained to create takeout or takeaway food, and it would service just an outdoor dining area of 575. Oh, I see. Oh, you're, you've connected it with that previous point. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I question, you know, we talk about Right now, we have 150, we allow 150 feet of outdoor dining. It's relatively minor, it's relatively low impact. I think everybody was sort of excited about when it was created, about creating that little opportunity for outdoor dining, but uh, I, we don't really have a lot of rules and regulations. So my seventh question was, what rules and regulations presently exist in the zoning regulations or our town code that regulate outdoor dining? And they're really, I, I'm just throwing that question out there. This is for your analysis. My eighth one is what rules and regulations presently exist that regulate the location and configuration of outdoor dining areas? And it can't really just be arbitrary. There has to be some sort of standards as to how it's done. And it, nine is are there presently any regulations that regulate the use of heating, heaters, ventilation, electrical service with respect to outdoor dining? Ten is, are there presently any regulations with respect to tents, roofs, canopies, umbrellas with respect to outdoor dining? Eleven, are there presently any regulations with respect to the safety of outdoor dining areas, such as fencing, barriers in parking lots and the like uh, that prevent, you know, some sort of really unfortunate accident? I mean, we've had cars go through the fronts of restaurants, certainly we don't want to going through yeah. diners, obviously, and I always think about it in New York City when people are sitting on 2nd Avenue with their backs to traffic. Uh, uh, regulations and provisions uh, for the removal of snow and ice when, when there is outdoor dining or how is that done or is that regulated at all? Uh, by what authority? And then I started thinking about, like, where this would happen. Like, when I look at a shopping center like uh, the one that has Craft 260 in it, and I think I mentioned this in the spring, right now that that shopping center is jam-packed, and there's a lot of restaurants in there. So I suppose they can apply for another 425 feet of outdoor dining on top. But uh, when I think about downtown, uh, the Post Road, as I understand it, is a state highway. Black Rock Turnpike is a state highway. And I question, and something we should think about, is what the authority of this commission is to regulate um, outdoor dining and public highway easements. In other words, the sidewalks are technically part of the state highway, part, part of the public highway easement. And similarly, that's on Black Rock Turnpike, but even on town roads, to what degree and how does this commission derive its authority to regulate the use of that. And I don't know, I mean, maybe there's a statute, I don't know, but I question that. Uh, I don't really understand the process, nor is it clear in any of the regulations, the process by which restaurants and other food service establishments with existing outdoor dining shall be able to expand the area and it was some sort of discussion of a zoning compliance application, but there's no, there's no real regulation that says, you know, thou shalt not block the way, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that. It's not, well, there's no regulation defining sort of what the rules and regulations are. Uh, I also don't really, I guess it's the same process for restaurants that presently have no outdoor dining and what the process is and I'm not sure a zoning compliance application because what is it really complying with in terms of standards because they're not in the regulations. 16 is, uh, again, addressing the, uh, addressing the uh, use of a zoning compliance application where there aren't a lot of regulations that describe what the rights are of the parties under the regulations. Uh, next is, Tony Green. 
Yeah. Can you email? You have those in Word or? Like, I do. Can you email those in? I have a hard copy I wasn't for you too. Yeah, I just wasn't expecting up to double digits. No, How many I restaurants? Well, it's just. I should know better. Train of thought. <laughs> I know. I should know better. Uh, how many restaurants and other food service establishments presently use and occupy parking spaces for outdoor dining? Uh, what is the legal authority by which this commission can say you can use parking spaces where your building has, by way of example, 400 square feet and one, 400 square feet of patron floor area? So if it's one per 40, you need 10 spaces. And two of your spaces are present presently being taken up by a tent or outdoor dining. So now you're down to eight spaces. So how do you do that? Because you're making it non-compliant with your regulations. And the suggestion of using a special permit, this commission, the McKenzie case in Monroe stood for the proposition that this commission, that zoning commissions, not this commission, all zoning commissions, can't regulate uses on a case-by-case -case basis. The Zoning Board of Appeals under 8-6 can waive the zoning regulations. This commission is charged with uniformity, you know, uh, in the enforcement of your regul in the application and enforcement of your regulations. So it gets kind of funny where different use, different properties, you know, using different numbers of spaces. So certainly the regulation can't somehow eliminate the, the zoning requirements that are clear as to the number of spaces you require. Uh, and I don't think it can, you can't waive the regulations pursuant to a special permit. That's not what special permits do. And then I'm not sure where it's written, uh, and I don't even know how the permitting operation and compliance of outdoor dining is enforced and overseen. I'm sure it falls on probably um, Jim and Matt, um, but it's not very clear because, again, I understand that there are problems with outdoor dining sometimes blocking, and everyone can kind of say, hey, you're blocking the way, but it, it's, not, it's not well defined. And then um, the last thing is, well, we already talked about it, is the impact on commercial real estate as it presently exists. And the last thing I would ask you to be mindful of is that while we want to support outdoor dining, there is this explosion in Uber Eats and Grubhub and delivery. And I'm not sure that we are, I, don't, I think we're all trying to catch up with that and what the impacts are on commercial properties and, use, and, and all kinds of commercial uses on the impact of those kinds of services on how we think about our regulations and think about parking requirements, having delivery spaces, and that kind of thing. So I will, I'd will i be happy to submit this list by email in the morning, but there's a lot to think about. And all I was, I, the, the thing that I just wanted to bring to you is that there's a lot to this, and it's just not a quick fix. And I think for it to be fair and uniform, and I think, we can provide outdoor dining to everyone probably in a way that's fair and that provides robust opportunities for outdoor dining, but we should do it in an orderly way. That's all. I'm, Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I just have a question for the chairman. Are we going to keep this public hearing open? Because I think there is a lot of information that we need to generate between now and when we render a decision. I know I would like to see it continued. Well, I mean, the only thing I've heard so far, I mean, besides, I guess, his questions, which I'm sure Mr. Barnhart will have answers to and citations and all that stuff, um, and I look forward to it. Um, we may, considering what um, the questions asked, but the only other thing other than Attorney Green was reaching out to the Bike Commission. So I'm not sure what else besides. I, mean, I, I may have other questions. I mean, I'm still digesting some. I mean, I think this is, I think, to Attorney Green's point, this is complicated. This is not as, you know, we do all support the restaurants, but we also have to do our diligence. And I think, you know, this has been around for a year now. I think we can wait another few weeks, continue, you know, asking questions and doing our diligence. No, you'll definitely have, yeah, I mean, come on up. Um, well, I mean, 
reach out to the any member of the public. I'm just asking I I'll, I'll get to that in a second, but let me just double check. Um, any member of the public wish to be heard uh, that's doing this remotely, joining us remotely or by telephone, please identify yourself. If you're on a telephone, push star six. six. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's fine. I just. <laughs> no, which is fine. I just figured we put it on the record. So I'll end the public comment portion. Um, to Commissioner Harrison's point, I mean, I, I, my my thought is if we, I mean, to, I'll listen to what, well, let me listen to Mr. Barhart first before we get into that. So, Mr. Barhart, any rebuttal? I heard I heard Attorney Green, I respect Attorney Green. Uh, however, I think Attorney Green has thrown a lot of information out there, but it, it's not as complicated as it is made to seem. We're proposing very modest changes to your existing regulations. The sub substance of those is essentially two sections. One is to eliminate uh, the three-quarter requirement of seating in an enclosed building, and the second is to increase uh, the allowance for uh, outdoor dining space uh, without providing additional parking from 150 to 575 feet uh, square feet. Uh, I will re reiterate that any new or expansion of outdoor dining will require a compliance application of this commission and site plan approval. So you'll have an opportunity to review whether or not the site uh, meets all these requirements. Uh, as it relates to it, nothing that we're proposing here uh, changes building, fire code. They still need to get uh, permits from the building official, from the fire marshal, as to outdoor heating elements, electrical fixtures and the like, those are all required. They're required now. We're not changing any of that. Uh, we're not suggesting that anyone can put an outdoor dining space in property that is not their own in, in public rights of way without securing the approval of either the state or the town. I, I know of one instance where we have a restaurant that has secured the permission of the state of Connecticut to have an outdoor dining space within the public right of way that's controlled within uh, the state DOT. They also have property on within the town's right of way, and they have secured a license and lease agreement with respect to that. I think we have a, a tradition here of recognizing that there is shared parking. That there is not necessarily the need to double, you know, create parking uh, twice. We've already, uh, when we uh, permit a restaurant, we need them to submit an application and demonstrate that they meet our existing parking requirements. Um, to go above and beyond that for outdoor dining space, it's not necessarily, uh, and I would suggest based on our observation and experience, not double the use, but there needs to be some observance of that. Um, so I, I, I would be interested to see the full list because I can respond. We certainly have a list of all the restaurants that are permitted in town, uh, just off the top of my head. It depends how you want to classify restaurants, uh, because we have food service establishments depending on, you know, whether it's in, in person. We do have takeout restaurants, uh, fast casual, you know, to uh, fast food, as well as, in, you know, uh, fine dining. Uh, we roughly say there's about 100 uh, you know, full service restaurants in town, but there are far, far more that have a health department permit. We can give you that, that list. But I, I would just close by reminding everyone here that in terms of uh, a new or, or an expansion of an existing outdoor dining, it still requires an application, uh, a compliance application of this commission. So you have an opportunity to review that at that time. And it, to the extent to which, um, a restaurant is proposing to permit an area that is within an outdoor, within a parking lot, uh, that's a higher level of review. And again, there may be circumstances where they have plenty of parking on property within, within the complex, and they can demonstrate that to your satisfaction. I think that is within your authority to grant that permission. So it's not a carte blanche approval by any stretch. I, I do think there's, uh, you know, we haven't reached out to Bike Pet. I'm, I'm certainly happy to do that. But you know, I listened very carefully to the comments that were made when we presented this back January 
um, and, and we had the, the, your deliberations in March and heard the comments and we did respond to each and every one of those comments, I believe. So with that, uh, I'm happy to, again, answer any questions or just rest my case, if you will. So. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, would you, would you like the commission to keep the hearing open one extra time to review the review the uh, questions and see if anything more, if you need to respond in any more detail that you have or to get any other information or are you, are you comfortable? Well, I'm in this unique position where I'm also staff. So well, I know. I that's believe kind of that I can respond to the, the, provide that information either myself or through the planning director to the commission and uh, we can ask that you close the hearing. I don't think there's any point to keeping the hearing open, but that's at your discretion. Mr. Chairman, I'm a member of the commission. And I have and asked not. if we can keep this open. I heard you. Okay. That's what I'm discussing. I'm not sure why we asked applicants. Well, I would like to know whether the applicant would like to consent to it. Okay. So it's not something Do that I... Do we need their consent? I'm asking. Do I don't need, need I don't need their consent, okay. but if they're going to consent to it, then I have the opening to do it. Okay. If he wants to close it, now I have a decision to make. Okay. But if he, has, if he actually consents to it, if he wants to, it's often a tactic to be used to be, okay, if they're going to do it, then we, everybody's on board and we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. You don't have to remind me you're a member of the commission either. So, I mean, my, my, I'm going to close the meeting because I don't believe there's any additional information that we need to get that we can't otherwise get in our, uh, through staff. So, unless anybody has any other questions, because uh, most of the things I think I heard from Attorney Green, I will review because I think that can be done with potentially if there is going to have any amendments, amending the text amendments, which we can do again. It doesn't require additional information from the public or sources. It's absorbing the information that he's, that the questions he's provided and seeing if any additional edits need to be made or any additional proposals, which we can do either as part of this or again, you know, going, you know, maybe not a denial without prejudice or something, or maybe we can reopen later if we need to, if uh, we come back with some edits that are so substantial that need to be put out to public hearing. But I mean, at this point, especially if the applicant believes he's done, I kind of believe it as well. So any additional comments or questions for the applicant? Commissioner Francis. Um, I like this column distance to curb. And most restaurants don't have it filled in. About five or ten of them do. Would it be hard to get that filled in? Um, to the extent that we've got the plan for the ones that have, we, we can we can. That that's kind of okay. what bothers me walking around town is why yeah, are you true. only leaving us three or four feet? which is a legal requirement, but yep. why isn't it more? Is this really your private property? And you have a right to be way out here. Yep. We can fill in that column. Thank you. That would be nice. I, mean, I never really thought about that before. And Mr. Green's, Attorney Green's point of configuration is interesting too. Some of them just kind of flop in front of businesses that aren't theirs, which I guess they don't care, but it's kind of strange. <laughs> they don't see tables and chairs from them in front of them. But we don't have any rules for configuration, so. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to get those such rigid rules because of how well, things are, but you never know. Just in front of your own property, <laughs> wouldn't you? And, but it's, it's not always. And well, I think some practice. of them come out four feet. And, you know, in strip malls, most of them are two feet, and then other ones will slam sandwich boards in the middle of the sidewalk when the little tables are right against the building for two feet like they should be. And, um, Any additional I questions? Any we will endeavor to fill in that distance to the curb call. I just have one comment on that, if I could make. Oh, uh, Commissioner Braun. The curb is what? What? What's the distance well, that's where the, to where? Well, well, the from, the from restaurant to the curb, like Archie Moore's, would be about six inches. Or from where the outdoor dining is to the curb. Some is on the opposite <laughs> right. side of the curb. I, you know, you're going to get strange answers there. What I right. meant was how much is supposed to be open for public passage. 
That's so, what I meant. And you're right. Maybe that isn't even what this means. Yeah, it, it, it's going to vary. You're right. That may be a misnomer, but as I understand, the question is, is do we have a data that, that shows what the general yeah, clear, clear pedestrian space? That, that, that's what I'm yeah. understanding your, your right. question. That's so, right. in, for example, the little pub, they're in the parking lot, so there's right. obviously... There's yeah, I'm not there. there. See, that, that's a different... Because, again, I wouldn't... I wouldn't I'm talking about the ones that the commission has reviewed and approved. The COVID protocol permits are a different animal um, uh, that, that is going to change going forward. Commissioner Braun? Yeah. Um, Did you have a question, comment? Yeah, I do. Um, do, we, do we have a deadline once we, what is the deadline if we, of closing the hearing? If, does the applicant have to agree for us to keep the hearing open or can we just keep it open? And what is our deadline to decide on this once we close the hearing? That's for Director Wendt, I guess. Yeah. I, I, I can answer. Thank you. The, the deadline to act once you close the hearing is 65 days. Um, and again, depending on, um, you, you can always make a, a regulation more restrictive than what was proposed without going back to hearing. Um, but in short, you have 65 days from tonight should the hearing close to render a decision and subject to uh, extensions. But the idea is we're trying to um, obviously um, there's going to be consensus or not with respect to these proposals, but the idea is to try to get a decision in time for restaurants to plan for infrastructure if they're going to be going forward with a new application in time for the next uh, season. So that's, but short answer to your question is 65 days from closing hearing. Yeah, I, our next, what is, yeah, our next meeting is, is when? Is it in November? Do we December not 13th. have another? Oh, it is? December 13th. Oh, December 13th. So if and I, I there's so many questions that came up, I, I would like to leave it open till then. So in case we need more information, we can get more information. I some of these things that came up by Attorney Green, I hadn't even thought of. And I would like and to And I see, think that's fair, but the question yeah. but my understanding, I mean I heard them too. I think we can get this information from staff. I don't think we need to get the, or even from Mr. Barnard, who is that, you know, Fairfield staff. I don't think we need to get this information from, you know, the rest of the public that are non non Fairfield staff. Um, and I'm, I'll, I will surmise that as a member of staff, considering uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas and stuff, if we need an extension for 65 days to get into it, the applicant would probably agree to that extension. Yeah. Yeah. I doubt that would be a problem. Yeah. So I mean, you know. It's 65 days, I guess, plus, you know, the uh, staff discount of more, I guess. But um, I think the intent was, as Mr. Wendt indicated, just giving restaurants enough time. Uh, if they wanted to go forward to plan accordingly, make an application. To yeah, no, and that's fair, too. Yeah. I mean, we just I don't understand yeah. what the parameters are. No, and I, I mean, I don't, considering we have one in December. And then we start in January, you know, time-wise, that should be fine, I guess. Uh, but it's the holidays, so, you know, maybe it takes late January or February. Um, but I don't think there's any information. But I don't think there's any information that we haven't heard that we can't get from staff, a member of Fairfield staff. I mean, if somebody thinks otherwise, let me know. But I, just, I haven't heard it otherwise. I think also we might consider getting town council to give us an opinion on some of these items. I have to look at the list first to see what I think. Which again, we can get, I think after close, so. Yeah, as, as do we. Now, if we come to the conclusion again, you know, we did back in April that we need more time and, you know, so be it, but I don't, I'd like to close it so we can, you know, move forward with the process because I have yet to hear what information from the public we need other than what we've received and everything else we can need, we can get from staff, any member of Fairfield staff, we can get once we close anyway. So, any other questions, comments? Right. Thank you, Mr. Barnard. Thank I'll you. close the hearing in this matter, and that's the end of our agenda, so I'll close the meeting.